Folklore, urban legends, and ghost stories have been passed down throughout Japan's history. Despite the impressive number of ghost stories that Japan harbors, none are as impactful and famous in its home country as Yotsuya Kaidan. And despite its fame and infamy within its home country, I have seen very little said about it outside of Japan. With that said, allow me to introduce you to a story filled with horror as well as betrayal. A story based on horrific real-life events and tied to equally real cursed locations. Yotsuya Kaidan, or the ghost story of Yotsuya, was officially written in the year 1825 by a man named Suriya Namboku IV. Its name comes from the story's setting, then a rural part of Edo, Japan, now a modern-day part of Shinjuku, Tokyo. That name being Yotsuya. Yotsuya is a part of Tokyo now. See, see, see what I'm saying? So this ghost story was initially written as a kabuki stage play, though in the many, many years since then, it's been adapted into various other media forms. At least 30 times as of right now in 2023. These other forms ranging from film, animation, to even manga. So, before we go ahead and look at the real-life horrors associated with this ghost story, let's go ahead and look at the ghost story itself. One regarded by many as Japan's most famous ghost story of all time. So here it is. Allow me to read you the ghost story of Yotsuya. The story opens with a ronin named Tamiya Iemon in a heated argument with Yotsuya Samon, the topic of argument being Oiwa the wife of Iemon and the daughter of Samon. Both men are ronin. They are samurai that lack a master and thus live in severe poverty. This occurrence was commonly seen during this post-war period of Japan that Yotsuya Kaidan was written within. Because Iemon, the husband, failed to support Oiwa, Samon was demanding he separate from her. Feeling Oiwa, and by extension, he, her father, deserved better. Oiwa herself had expressed her dismay to her father. Now, Iemon himself is not a good person. Instead of making an honest living, he scams and steals from others. He is not after anyone's best interest, including Oiwa's. With that said, Iemon's actions in response to his father-in-law's request is typical of his character. For, you see, Iemon disagrees with Samon. He feels disrespected and thus becomes enraged. This leads to Iemon murdering Samon, Oiwa's father. While all of this is transpiring, Oiwa had no choice but to try and make ends meet by her own accord. This unfortunately meant sneaking out to the red light district and doing the only thing she could do to get money to support herself and simply live. Well, the only thing a woman of that era could do to support herself without a husband. Or at least a husband willing to support both of them. Oiwa hoped to be able to escape the awful treatment she received from her husband by supporting herself in the only way she was able. After the incident with her father, Iemon returns home to an unknowing Oiwa. He lies and tells her her father was randomly attacked by a bandit and did not survive. Upon hearing this, Oiwa fell into a deep despair vowing to seek vengeance and come after the person who caused her father's demise. Iemon, being the manipulative person he was, told Oiwa he would seek this vengeance himself if she promised to stay by his side and never leave, remaining his wife. Oiwa, in a state of sheer devastation, reluctantly agrees. Some time passes and Oiwa becomes pregnant, she gives birth to a healthy baby boy, but she herself becomes ill following the delivery, childbirth proving far too much for her. And because Iemon was already a horrible husband, he proves to be an additionally horrid father. Instead of being grateful that his wife was still alive and with him and that she brought his son into the world, Iemon became even more abusive. He came to resent the both of them and see them as a burden. He did not want a child or a sickly wife who could not care for this child. And it was at this very time when Oiwa was ill and needed love and support more than ever when another woman came into the picture. This woman was named Ome, 
and she was the granddaughter of a very wealthy doctor. She had an unnatural obsession with Iemon and was wildly jealous of his wife. The grandfather, wanting to help his beloved granddaughter to get what she desired, paid a visit to the home of Iemon and Oiwa. The doctor acts as though he's providing the struggling family with a service out of the kindness of his heart and provides Oiwa with an ointment. He tells Oiwa to rub this ointment on her face every day and she will be cured. She will be healthy once again. Only, this was not a treatment for her illness. The ointment contained chemicals that severely burned and disfigured Oiwa's face. With each passing day of use, Oiwa's face became extremely disfigured from all these severe burns. So much so that those who saw her face would flinch from how gruesome the sight was. Though nobody had the guts to tell Oiwa how bad her face really looked. With that That, Ome felt more confident in being the more beautiful woman. Her grandfather then made Iemon an offer. To marry Ome and be offered a well-paying job as a samurai. No longer would Iemon be a ronin without a master or employer. And Iemon, who was now disgusted by the sight of his wife and her burnt face, accepted this offer without any thought whatsoever. In fact, he was delighted to receive such an offer. And during all of this, Oiwa was still unaware of how horrible her face had looked. She thought the burning sensation of the ointment simply meant that it was working, as that is what she was told. And despite everything she had already been through, Oiwa was about to be met with further hardship. You see, Iemon didn't just want to leave his wife. He wanted to make sure he still looked like a good guy after doing so. Like he was the one being wronged in the whole situation. And for that reason, Iemon paid a friend of his to enter the family's home and force himself onto Oiwa. Iemon planned to just walk in and act as though he caught her having an affair. But things didn't go as planned. The friend arrives and sees the sight of Oiwa, her face brutally disfigured at this point, and still as sick and bedridden as she was following childbirth. And on top of it all, she was all alone. Suddenly feeling great remorse, the friend instead tells Oiwa what her husband had planned for her. He also revealed that Iemon himself was the one who murdered her father. Finally, he holds a mirror to Oiwa's face and reveals the state she is in. After hearing everything and finally knowing the truth about the kind of person her husband was and what really happened to her father, Oiwa enters a fit of rage. In this rage, Oiwa gets up and begins combing her hair to prepare to confront those who wronged her. Hair brushing was seen as a very appealing and seductive action during this time in Japan, especially if the hair was long and healthy, which Oiwa's hair still was. And for that reason, the friend of Iemon simply watched on with interest. However, that interest eventually turned into sheer horror. The burns had unknowingly spread to Oiwa's scalp, and unfortunately, her hair began to come out in large chunks due to the damaged scalp. This left half of Oiwa's head completely burned and bald. As Oiwa witnessed her hair fall out with the comb, the rage only grew, now completely unable to be contained. Oiwa, in a blind rage, tried to rush out the door only intending to harm and disfigure those who did the very same thing to her. Iemon's friend attempts to stop her, but she's impossible to hold back. Amidst the struggle, Oiwa falls forward accidentally, fatally wounding herself against the friend's samurai's sword. The wound is fatal, and Oiwa passes away then and there, but not before muttering Iemon's name over and over until her final breath.
the friend, terrified by the possible repercussions of what just occurred, had fled the scene. Oiwa wasn't discovered again until the next morning by a servant. This servant rushed to tell Iemon, though instead of being mortified by Oiwa's death, or even that his plan went differently than he had intended, Iemon was overjoyed. Before the servant could leave Iemon's presence, he was met with his very own demise. At the hands of Iemon. Iemon then went on to tell everyone that Oiwa and the servants were having an affair together, and thus went on to marry the doctor's wealthy granddaughter with no remorse. The wedding of Iemon and Ome had transpired peacefully, though it was what had occurred that very evening when Iemon had laid with his new bride for the very first time, where the horror truly began. In the dark of night, when turning to Ome in their bed, Iemon was startled to see Ome's face replaced with the disfigured, gray, lifeless one of Oiwa. It was pale, gray, and cold. Her face was sinister and full of malice, an expression Oiwa had never held when alive. Though it could not be mistaken, Oiwa's face had nefarious intent and she was after Iemon. With the sight displayed before him, Iemon began to panic. He took out his sword and swung it at the woman. When everything was said and done, and Iemon was a bit more calm, Oiwa's ghostly face had vanished, and it was returned to its original form. And there laid Ome, lifeless on the ground from Iemon's actions. Iemon was nothing short of frightened, and he left the home. As Iemon fled in the dark of night, he was met with the ghost of the servant, standing in the middle of the road. His wounds, the wounds inflicted by Iemon himself, were still visible, but his form was white as a sheet, truly appearing undead. Iemon blindly attacked out of fear once more. It was following this attack that the servant had vanished and the old doctor had remained, leaving Iemon responsible for the passing of both Ome and the doctor. By this point, Iemon was in a full state of panic, hyperventilating as he ran as fast as his legs could carry him, trying to escape the horrors, the paranoia, and the supposed hallucinations that led him to his actions. He was unaware of where he was going, even his surroundings. All he knew was to escape. Though, Oiwa does not allow him to escape. Her ghost appears at every turn, down every road Iemon flees down, materializing everywhere he went. With that same expression of malice, Iemon continued to flee. As the days and nights went on, Iemon remained on the run. Every flickering light on a lantern he saw was Oiwa's disfigured face. In his dreams every night when he could sleep, she haunted them, never allowing him to rest. Desperate and losing his grasp on reality, Iemon fled to the mountains, far from any civilization. This is where he slowly went completely and utterly insane, seeing Oiwa everywhere. He was never seen or heard from again. This was because, through a slow and painful insanity, Oiwa received her revenge for both herself and her father. And that, my friends, is the story of Yotsuya Kaidan. Now, there are much longer versions of this story, particularly the original play that has a lot of different subplots and other things going on in addition to the actual main plot. Every adaptation has its own spin on it as well. Though what has always remained is the ghost story of Oiwa and how she was betrayed and wronged and how she became a vengeful ghost in spirit. Rightfully so, I think. So, what I told you was the main story. 
Now, to those familiar with horror, or Japanese horror more specifically, this story may not come off as anything too startling or disturbing in any way, but mind you, the story is almost 200 years old at this point. There are many tropes and story elements introduced here in Yotsuya Kaidan that went on to inspire other Japanese horror stories in the years to follow. The story of Yotsuya Kaidan has evolved into the modern day horror and even creepypasta and forum horror that you see today. So, TLDR, this story is pretty impactful when considering Japanese horror and the history of Japanese horror as a whole. Similarly to how the likes of Sailor Moon and Creamy Mommy inspired the abundance of magical girl anime out there today, Yotsuya Kaidan was a bit of a pioneer within its genre. Arguably the most famous modern horror to be inspired by Yotsuya Kaidan was Ringu or The Ring, as Sadako herself was inspired by the character Oiwa. Moving back over to the story itself, among the most prominent story elements was the role of the character Oiwa and her shift to transforming into an Onryo. Onryo are ghosts of those who were wronged and betrayed while they were alive. During their transition to the afterlife, they became utterly immersed by their intent on revenge, and thus become a dark entity in order to seek out this revenge. Their only purpose is to ensure vengeance and the suffrage of those who had wronged them. The people responsible for wronging an Onryo can never escape their wrath. Many onryo have existed throughout Japanese history, some through folklore and ghost stories, while others are believed to have existed in real life. These recorded observances date as far back as the year 797 in the history text Shoku Nihongi. As far as more recent times, onryo have been seen in anime, video games, and film. You may have also noticed Oiwa's scarred face, or more specifically, that half-scarred face where half of it is normal, the other half is mutilated and horribly burned. You may have also noticed that there's characters in modern media that are pretty similar in appearance to that. Two examples that come to mind for me personally are Todoroki from My Hero Academia, as well as Zuko from Avatar. Not one, but two real-life murders were used as the inspiration for Yotsuya Kaidan. These real-life news stories were heavily sensationalized during this time period. Remember the use of the servant in the story itself? And how Iemon used that servant to dispose of Oiwa in a way that retained his own reputation? This was partially based on a heavily publicized real-life incident. Two servants had plotted to murder their respective masters and, well, they did it. They certainly didn't get away with their actions, however, as they were caught and punished severely the very same day they committed the crimes. And there was yet another real-life incident. This one involved a samurai who had caught one of his concubines having an affair with her servant. This samurai was anything but merciful, having thrown both into the Kanda River after restraining them to a board of wood. I did try to find more information on these two cases myself, while many sources cite that these were inspirations for the ghost story, I could not find anything detailing the cases themselves, though this was 200 years ago. And now, while not directly based on any real-life events, there's also the unsavory portrayal of the Ronin. While Samurai were once respected and served a great purpose, they were left without any duty in times of peace, after war had subsided. This led to many real-life ronin to turn to a life of crime due to sudden poverty. This was a real-life issue in Japan that was not fully touched upon until the premiere of Yotsuya Kaidan. And then there's the Shrine of Oiwa, the real-life Shrine of Oiwa, found in the Myogoji Temple within modern-day Tokyo. There is also Oiwa's gravesite a short distance away within the Sugamo ward of Tokyo. But hold on, if Oiwa didn't actually exist, why did she have a shrine and a gravesite? Well, that's because a real-life Yotsuya Oiwa did actually exist. And she was also the basis for the Kabuki play and even folklore and ghost stories that preceded it. That's right, 
Even before the play, the general structure of Oiwa's ghost story was passed around as a folktale, and it's said that it all originated with this one specific Oiwa. According to the sign's place at the shrine altar, this Oiwa lived a happy life with a supportive, loving husband. Despite that, it's been said that the very first incarnation of Oiwa's ghost story was created out of jealousy and spite. By who exactly? We don't really know for certain. Perhaps a real-life Ome. It's believed the story of Yotsuya Kaidan had caused unease with the real Oiwa who was resting in peace prior to that. After the story came about, those at the shrine began witnessing a great deal of paranormal activity. Some cite Oiwa's shrine as among the most haunted locations within Tokyo. According to those who were involved in adaptations of Yotsuya Kaidan over the years, a lot of accidents during filming or rehearsals would occur. All of these accidents were bizarre and unexplained. For this reason, it's become a tradition for every cast and crew working on a Yotsuya Kaidan project to visit both the shrine and the grave of Oiwa to appease her spirit and prevent any accidents or hardship. And apparently, no accidents or paranormal incidents have ever occurred since this tradition began. And that is the story and the lore of Yotsuya Kaidan. Story and lore so influential to Japanese media, yet not really known at all in the West. There is so much interesting Japanese folklore out there, it's really... This is really the tip of the iceberg, and... That doesn't mean I'm making an iceberg on Japanese folklore, I'm just saying there's... There's a lot. Though that's an idea. While Japan is filled with many folk tales and unconfirmed urban legends, real tragedy and horror was seen at this very spot. They say that Toyama Park, after the sun sets, is among the most terrifying places in the country, in an unsuspecting area of Shinjuku, Tokyo. Many passerbys have reported hearing the blood-curdling scream of a man within the park. These same reports have been a constant for decades. There was also the unearthing of hundreds of human bones beneath the park some years ago. What... what exactly happened here? The horrible events that took place here predate the park itself, having occurred in the 1940s. This was when a few undisclosed medical facilities were in place where the park now stands. The term medical facility, one specifically to treat those who sustained injuries from war, is the technical and official description. But what actually occurred within these walls is far more nefarious than the name allows you to think. You see, there have been many accounts of gruesome experimentation taking place here. Prisoners of war, captured during the final years of World War II, were speculated to have been exposed to deadly substances here, against their will. Those substances likely being anthrax and bubonic plague. Doctors monitored and ultimately dissected these victims at this very spot where the park now stands. It's believed that the discovered remains are the victims and that Toyama Park was their resting place for decades. Those who live in the area near the park also claim to have seen Hitodamas, which are often described as floating flame-like objects. According to Japanese folklore, this object, the Hitodama, is a detached human soul. Funny thing is, there were accounts of Hitodamas being seen here before the bodies were discovered and the truth was known. Located in rural Hokkaido, Yubetsu was once a thriving mining town that offered a comfortable lifestyle to its inhabitants. This was due to the overabundance of coal mine from the aforementioned mines. Active from 1923 all the way up until 1970, Yubetsu saw as much prosperity as it did catastrophe. Over its 47 years of activity, there were at least 189 lives lost. These were from mining accidents, ranging from gas explosions to portions of the mine caving in and burying the workers alive. Even the citizens of the town itself faced tragedy directly with a serious parasitic outbreak. 
one that also took numerous lives. After the mine was shut down for good, the town saw the loss of its primary source of income and thus lost many residents, making the former mining village of 15,000 residents a ghost town. A far cry from its glory days, if you can call them that. The Yubetsu mines have been abandoned for over 50 years now. While generally deemed off-limits, this spot is famous among ghost hunters and anyone with enough bravery to check the site itself out. The spot has become somewhat of a test of courage to many young people in the area. Some Hokkaido locals see visiting the mines as a coming-of-age practice. Many also visit the abandoned hospital that sits near the mines, one that obviously saw as much trauma as the mines itself. The spot is also famous and frequently visited, as it's easier and likely safer to access. Though, that doesn't make it less haunted. Those who do visit either area claim to experience dizziness and migraines that worsen until they leave the area. An urban legend surrounding the mines claims that visitors will receive a call on their mobile phone from an unknown number, and that caller will call constantly, over and over demanding the owner pick up. It doesn't matter if the cell phone is off or on silent, the call will still go through and it will still constantly ring as long as you remain within the mines. According to this legend, under no circumstances should this call be answered. If one does answer the call, they will hear the sound of a woman screaming, and thus will become cursed. Those who instead visit the abandoned hospital claim to hear this very same woman screaming, though not through a phone, but in person through the halls of the hospital itself. To those familiar with the Sunshine 60 building in Ikebukuro, Tokyo, you may be a bit confused by this one being on the list. The Sunshine 60 building itself is a well-known landmark within Sunshine City, a very popular spot for tourists and locals alike. It has cute, fun things like an aquarium, a Pokemon cafe, and even a virtual amusement park. Though, don't be fooled, beneath all this shiny new infrastructure lies another spot with a very dark and tragic history. This very same site once housed the infamous Sugamo prison. Said prison was unique in that it was meant to specifically hold political prisoners. This was until 1945 when thousands of war-related criminals were housed at Sugamo as well. To those unaware, Japanese prisons are among the most strict and gruesome in the world. It's akin to a boot camp, as everything you do, from the way you talk to your sleeping and eating habits, are strictly enforced with severe punishment if not done correctly. Prisoners after the war were routinely starved and forced to perform manual labor as well. It was inevitable that some prisoners would perish during such imprisonment. Some specifically faced more extreme sentences, as routine executions would also take place at Tsugamo. These prisoners of war were housed from 1945 up until 1962, when the prison was closed for good. The building itself remained in place until its destruction in 1971. The empty lot remained until the Sunshine 60 building began construction and was ultimately completed and opened in 1978. The skyscraper was flocked to as it was the largest building in Japan from its opening up until 1991. It appeared that the gruesome past of the site was soon forgotten. That is, until some of its visitors began witnessing paranormal activity within the building. Some claimed to have visually witnessed ghosts, more specifically humanoid figures in prison uniforms. The building itself frightens those who know its history, as it's sometimes described as having the shape of a gravestone. To this day, many flock to the stores of Sunshine 60, often on rainy days as it's well known as a fun place when the weather is poor. However, many also visit this building for ghost hunting or during a tour of Tokyo's most notorious ghost spots. While tuberculosis is a long eradicated threat in much of the world, it's remained a serious health threat in Japan for many years. 
Tuberculosis awareness PSAs still air in modern Japan as the majority of the population is older and has weaker immune systems. The very worst of this disease was seen in the 1930s and 1940s as a full-on epidemic had swept through Japan. The tragedy in its wake was unyielding. It's difficult to understand now, but tuberculosis was often a slow and painful death sentence to those diagnosed. It was because of the large number of tuberculosis cases that the Kaisaka Hospital was created in 1948. This structure sits within Osaka, the second largest city in Japan. Because of its location, the hospital was made to be one of the most advanced treatment centers in the country at that time. Even offering classrooms for children who suffered from the long-term effects of tuberculosis. Because this hospital was necessary to those with severe and complex cases, many deaths were unfortunately seen here. Because of that, it's said that many eventual spirits dwell here. The spirits of those who got cheated out of a full and healthy life. The hospital had stayed open for over 40 years and had shifted more so to a center for disabled children by the early 90s. In 1992, when the hospital closed permanently, the staff curiously left everything within the building. This included furniture, documents, and even the medical equipment. Why they left everything on the property is completely unknown. In the decades following, the hospital has fallen to ruin. Many urban explorers have entered the hospital to explore it, many of which felt an intense negative spiritual energy and noted that even the surgical equipment was still left out. This supposedly included used scalpels and robes that were not cleaned or put back. The horrific sights of the spot place it in infamy as a renowned haunted location. Many who enter the deteriorated structure note the faint voice of a man telling them to return home. This spot was once meant to be a luxury beachside hotel meant to cater to the growth in tourism in Okinawa in the 1970s. The property was ambitious, meant to host a zoo, amusement park, and pool. While those invested in the project were optimistic, the locals were anything but. It's said that monks visited the site and begged the developers to immediately cease construction. It wasn't simply because the hotel could ruin the area's local traditions and culture. While also valid, there was a much bigger issue at hand. The land the hotel was being built upon was home to sacred religious sites as well as numerous graves. The pleas from the monks were ignored and the rapid construction continued. As it did continue, numerous construction-related accidents had occurred. Due to this, more and more of the workers had quit ultimately leaving the developers with little to no staff to continue. The lead developer, in an attempt to prove the site was not haunted, decided to stay one single night in what was completed. According to reports, co-workers found this man within the property the next morning. He was mumbling incoherently and not mentally present. The man appeared to have gone insane. After this, the developer allegedly went missing never to be seen from again. This hotel project was then abandoned and slowly became ruin, broken down further by the surrounding nature and vegetation. In the years following, the abandoned hotel had been named the most haunted spot in Okinawa. Okinawa itself is said to be home to many ghosts and spiritual activity, but the ruins of this hotel supposedly topped them all. While many have visited the site, with a large number of people claiming to have seen or heard spirits within the halls, the entire hotel property was demolished in 2020. This school was built in 1906 in response to a surge in population around Bibai, an area of Hokkaido that once housed the Mitsubishi Bibai coal mine. Much like Yubetsu, the small mining community saw a boom in resources, but also a great deal of incidents and deaths. Numahigashi Elementary is unique, as it saw unexplained spiritual occurrences even before the mines were closed and people had left the town. 
The school also saw a lot of name changes as it was originally referred to as Banosawa Simple Education Center. There is little documentation from the early days of the schoolhouse, but it's been speculated that the frequent name changes were done to disassociate the school from the routine abductions of the students that had occurred there. Hokkaido in itself has seen a lot of missing children's cases in the early 1900s. But this school had seen an unusual number even for back then. One recovered record mentions a young girl who had disappeared during a very brief class break. The schoolhouse teacher had asked around town and nobody had seen the girl, not even her parents who lived very close by. Neither the girl herself nor any of her belongings were found or recovered in the area. The girl was never seen again. Many locals in the area saw the disappearance as the girl spiriting away. This term is prevalent in Japanese folklore. It refers to those who had vanished without any trace. And it is said that gods or spirits remove select people who are outcasts or had upset a deity. They are said to be transported to an unknown place, often thought to be the spirit world or afterlife. The ruins that remain of Numahigashi Schoolhouse are seen as dangerous with an overabundance of negative spiritual energy. Locals do everything in their power to avoid going near the schoolhouse and the surrounding forest. Claiming to hear the unsettling giggles of a child and even the glowing silhouette of one with a red backpack at night. This name, which translates to Howling Dog Tunnel, is the site of a grotesque murder that took place in the late 1980s and is now a popular ghost spot. The tunnel itself is located in Miyawaka town of Fukuoka Prefecture. What actually happened the night of the murder, the night where 20-year-old Koichi Umeyama was brutally tortured and ultimately killed by a group of young men simply because he refused to let them steal his car, is disturbing to say the least. Ultimately, all four of the men involved in the murder went to prison for their crimes. While the tunnel itself is almost completely closed off, it is still possible to go see it and even attempt to go inside if you're brave enough to attempt it. Photos and videos of the location itself exist and it's pretty unsettling. If there's anything I could describe as having a truly threatening aura, this would be it. Those out there familiar with my Do Not Search Iceberg series of videos may already be familiar with Inuaki Tunnel, a very real location in Fukuoka Prefecture which was the setting of multiple murders. Inuaki Village is an urban legend that came about in the wake of the tragedies that took place in this tunnel. While the story of Inuaki Village itself dates back as far as the early 1990s, it really gained traction on Tuchan when the story was passed around and users even claimed to have visited the location itself. While the story itself dates back to as far as the early 1990s, it really gained traction on Tuchan when the story was passed around and users even claimed to have visited the village itself. Inuaki Village is said to exist on a small side road you see after going through Inuaki Tunnel. Which side? Who is to say? Perhaps the road appears before you upon walking through the Inuaki Tunnel completely, which may be difficult to do in the present day as it is now almost completely sealed shut. According to legend, the village itself does not recognize Japanese law or even the Japanese constitution itself. If one visits Inuaki Village, you're essentially entering a lawless land without any sense of morality. There are many different versions of this actual narrative available online, the most famous version being a very early form of creepypasta, though at its core is referred to as a kowai hanashi, or scary story. This story goes as follows. In the early 1970s, a couple was driving to Hisayama, a city also within Fukuoka Prefecture. During their trip, their car unexpectedly breaks down in a desolate area surrounded by forests near the eastern base of Inuaki Mountain. With no other choice, they exited the vehicle in search of help. 
Eventually, while following a small road, they see a sign stating that the Japanese constitution would not be recognized beyond that point. The couple took it as some kind of prank and nothing more. With that considered, they continued onward. Upon reaching a small village, they assume it was abandoned some time ago as no people were around. The couple was just about to turn around and head back down the path they went down before being stopped by a crazed elderly man. He welcomed the couple to Inuaki village before pulling out a sickle and attacking them. As far as the outside world, the world that knew this couple understood, the couple in question was simply never seen or heard from again. There is another, less popular variant of this story. One that claims that a call is made to a telephone booth near Inuaki Bridge one time every night. It is said that if somebody answers that nightly call to the phone booth, they will be transported to Inuaki Village and cursed. Upon arriving, they will slowly lose control of their mind and body from this curse. The legend of Inuaki Village is well known in Japan and left a lot of online users searching for the village and trying to figure out where it would be placed on a map. Weird thing is, a real-life Inuaki Village did actually exist in Japan. This real-life equivalent predated the legend, the tunnel, and the murders that occurred in the tunnel. Having existed from 1691 to 1889 in what is present-day Miyawaka City after the village itself grew and merged with the surrounding areas. A famous screamer video in Japanese urban legend that came about from a video uploaded to YouTube in August of 2007. The video is very vague, ominous, and filled with creepy stuff. It's best known for its Jeff the Killer jump scare towards the end of the video, though the video itself is over 5 minutes long. The video begins with 30 seconds of a no-signal screen, followed by a whole lot of off-putting music, industrial sepia tone imagery, and an unexplained list of names alongside their ages, supposedly. It's at the very end of the video that we get a very spooky hallway, an even spookier kid, and then spooky Jeff jump scare. Another message then appears on the screen, a message that translates to, these will be tomorrow's victims, or ashita no gisecha wa kono katagata desu. There's also an additional message that basically says o yasumi nasai, which is a slightly formal and commonly used phrase that just means goodnight. In addition, this video predates the popular Jeff the Killer creepypasta. It's actually the first confirmed screamer video to include the Jeff image. Some speculate that the goodnight message at the end of the special broadcast inspired the Jeff in the Western creepypasta telling his victims to go to sleep. Who knows, though? Following this upload, the NNN special broadcast mystery became quite popular on Tuchan. Tuchan is where urban legends and creepypastas especially started to come about as people discussed what all this could mean and what the lore could entail. There are different variants of the legend, but it usually goes like this. At the end of a TV's daily broadcast late at night after the station will sign off and the color bars will have officially appeared for some time, the NNN special broadcast will come on. Some versions state it comes on randomly if you watch TV late at night, however. Once on, the special broadcast will list the names of tomorrow's victims. According to the version of the legend you're reading, the reader may also be unable to change the channel. Another element of the story is that the very last name in the credit roll style list will be your own name. All of these names will be tomorrow's victims, yours included. It is inferred that your name is added to this list due to watching the special broadcast. On another note, this video style is a parody of Japan's NNN emergency broadcasts. NNN is short for Nippon News Network. A Tuchan user created this thread upon receiving a series of terrifying letters in their mailbox after returning home from a business trip. None of these letters were addressed to the original poster. 
instead being addressed to a man they did not know by the name Asamu Sakuto-sama. The speaker of the letter uses the Sama honorific at the end of this person's name. This is usually reserved for a person of very high status or even a god. Included in this initial post was an image of all the letters they had received by that point in time. Five in total. Some of the letters were folded in strange, ornamental ways. None of these letters had stamps or the address written on them. They weren't even sealed in envelopes. The only reasoning behind this being that the sender must have hand-delivered these letters themselves. What was deemed the first letter detailed the writer recently getting out of the hospital. Despite this, the bulk of most letters made no sense and had no flow or clear understanding. One portion of this letter stating that the speaker remembered exactly when they met this Asamu person and that her eyes turned completely white in order to read Asamu's mind. Also, that she constantly heard a song playing around her. There's also a bit that mentions her quote-unquote pets, though this is never clarified and it kind of seems like they're not her actual pets. Much like the contents in the other four letters, OP had shared photos of every letter they received, each one being signed by a person who referred to themselves as Reda, written in English characters. While all of this in itself is unsettling, what may be the most unsettling element of this first letter is this. A self-portrait that Reda included with that first letter. The second letter was even more confusing and disturbing. It included yet another self-portrait, this one of Reda unclothed with four separate legs, and an eye on her abdomen as well as her hair. Included were more disjointed phrases and Reda claiming that she was overwhelmed by feelings of resentment because she felt somebody watching her every day and night, even while she was sleeping. Naira also complained that she was surrounded by trash, quote-unquote, and that Asamu soon would be surrounded by trash as well. Most people in this thread agreed that Naira was definitely unwell and had some extreme obsession with this Asamu person. In the later letters, Asamu was later referred to as Asami. It's unclear if this was a typo or not. In these later letters, Reda goes on to explain that she sees a doll in her room looking at her and moving, and she also has an urge to eat ink. She also mentions having a husband, and possibly having seen Asami a previous December. It is unclear how long ago this December was. Curious about this Asamu person, other posters urged OP to speak to his landlord and see if they were the previous tenant. OP later claimed to have done so and that his landlord had never heard that name before. However, the leasing company was able to find complaints from the previous tenant relating to unpleasant letters. And the tenant before that? They had apparently complained that they were being harassed by someone. Then came more information. Contact info from the mother of the harasser of that tenant. Her daughter was apparently hospitalized following this harassment incident, with the mother apologizing on the daughter's behalf when it had occurred. It was with this new information that the leasing office was able to get in contact with the mother once more. It was here where it was confirmed that it was Dera's mother. Apparently, after hearing this new information about the letters, Dera's mother called to check on her daughter. She first contacted Dera directly on the phone, and Dera became defensive and hung up, denying everything. The mother then called Dera's fiancé. He did share that he recently bought Dera some new stationery, stationery that matched what these letters were being written on. But he was working so often that he wasn't able to keep tabs on Dera and often left her home alone. The mother contacted the office once again, saying she would be driving to visit her daughter in person and address all of this. Meanwhile, those in the thread asked OP a barrage of questions, trying to figure out the situation, though some also felt that OP could be just making it all up. The mother updated the office once again. Apparently, Reda had left home and nobody knew where she went. 
this wasn't exactly a good sign for OP, as Lera could be going back to his home. Turns out, that's exactly what she did. A few hours later, OP updated the thread, hearing aggressive scratching and banging on his door. He ignored it and called the police straight away. Said police showed up long after the scratching and banging had stopped. Following this, he met Neda's mother at the police station and both agreed to questioning regarding the situation. Neda's mother shared that Asamu Sakuto was the screen name of a person Neda had met on an online dating site many years ago. Following this questioning, OP checked the mail after returning home to find one more letter. He provided a photo of it. It only had one single phrase written in the center of the paper. Mata kurune, or I'll return. It was in pink ink and signed by Reda. With that, OP had dealt with enough and, like the previous tenant, decided to move. It was shortly following this decision that OP said he was already looking at a new place and that his story and the letters were unfortunately very real. That he wished this whole ordeal wasn't real. And with that, we never saw a follow-up. If this story was real, OP likely moved and hopefully they'd uh, receive further help. Kisaragi Station may very well be the most renowned topic that originated on Tuchan. While creepypasta enthusiasts may be very familiar with this story, the actual thread that inspired it is rather interesting in itself. For the original thread was not a completed story. It was an actual back and forth between a seemingly lost poster and concerned people engaging with her in the thread. The original thread had surfaced in the year 2001, with a poster who referred to herself as Hasumi, who believed she was lost and got on the wrong train on her way home from work one evening. Hasumi was very confused about where she was. The train was not making any stops, it hadn't for quite some time, and all other passengers around her were asleep. On Hasumi's typical work commute, there were many stops and she was very familiar with its patterns. This time around, it was very different. People within the thread were intrigued, trying to get details about where she was so that they could pinpoint it and help her get home. This thread was created very early in the morning when only a few people were active on the site. One poster suggested going to the car that held the train conductor in it. She did so, but said there was a curtain covering that area and she couldn't see who was operating the train itself. Hasumi claimed she had knocked on the window in an attempt to speak to the conductor, but nobody responded. Another suggestion was to look out the window to see signs from any station they had passed. This was when Hasumi described going through a long tunnel. She also later clarified that her usual route didn't have any tunnels and that she departed from Shin Hanamatsu Station, which is a real station in Shizuoka Prefecture. Before long, Hasumi updated the thread yet again and said the train had finally made a stop. She looked outside the train to see a sign that said Kisaragi Station. Nobody in the thread had ever heard of the station name before. Those who googled it said nothing came up. They urged Hasumi to stay on the train until reaching the final stop on that line, as there would likely be taxis available at the final stop for her to get home. Hasumi instead got off the train to look for more information. During this brief period, the train left her. She was the only passenger to get off. Hasumi then added that she contacted her parents to pick her up, but they were also unsure where Kisaragi Station was. She had also added that one of the kanji used in spelling Kisaragi Station was also the kanji for devil, making it appear as though the station name read Devil's Station if it was read incorrectly. Hasumi left the station and saw no roads or traces of civilization. She then decided to walk along the tracks. This was when she heard the sound of taiko drums in the distance as she walked. Shortly following this was someone shouting at her to get away from the tracks. She turned around and saw an old man behind her with only one leg. 
This man quickly disappeared. The sound of drums grew louder as Hasumi came across another tunnel and went through it. She then met a man at the other side who offered a driver to a hotel and then claimed they were near a town called Hina. With this, Hasumi claimed the man was muttering to himself in the car. She felt uncomfortable, and her phone battery was running out. Hasumi concluded that this would be her last post, and it was. Now, while Kisaragi Station is pretty chilling as a scary story, many feel the story may have had truth to it and that Hasumi crossed over to another dimension or even the afterlife. People have tried figuring out where Kisaragi Station would be on a map as well, and it was this story's creepypasta status in the West that makes it so well known today. The tale that I am about to tell you is a curious one. One that affected numerous people for over a decade during the end of Japan's Showa period, one that still brings fear to those who witnessed it, to the point that incidents involving this topic remain a taboo in certain circles. Allow me to introduce you to the Ikiningyo, otherwise known in English as the Living Doll. Its namesake is for good reason. This doll's story remains an in infamy in Japan to this day, most notably for one of its television appearances in the late 1970s. A TV appearance that resulted in various mishaps that were witnessed live by thousands of viewers. Viewers who swear they witnessed this incident to this day. Though, before I get a little too ahead of myself, let's back up a little. To understand the namesake of the Ikiningyo, we must go back to the very beginning, that being 1976. Enter Junji Inagawa, a man known fairly well in Japan's television industry today particularly for his appearances on such shows as Takashi's Castle during the 1980s. During the 1970s, however, Inagawa was involved in two specific areas of the entertainment industry, those being radio and stage plays. The latter focusing particularly on bunaku plays, these productions showcase puppet-like dolls that resemble Japanese Hina or Ichimatsu dolls. Bunaku dolls are slightly larger and more articulated to accommodate fluid movements on stage. All was well in Inagawa's life and career, though it's when Inagawa was set to work on a folk music radio broadcast late one night that the first of many vexatious events occurred. It began with sudden, unanticipated crying. Crying that was hysterical and unable to be stopped. The crying came from one of the performers that were a guest on the show that evening. As Inagawa made his way to this performer, the station director was already trying to console him, to no avail. When this musician finally came to, he explained that he heard a woman's voice on the radio as one of his songs were being played. This voice belonged to a woman he knew, a woman who was now deceased. The intense feelings of sadness and longing for this woman overwhelmed the man and he was unable to shake these feelings despite his best efforts. The musician remained upset for the remainder of the broadcast. He was so distraught as it wrapped up that Inagawa ultimately escorted the man to his home after the broadcast had ended. Inagawa and the musician entered a taxi together, the stress of the night seemingly resolved and simmering down a bit. Only, this was solely the beginning. As Inagawa rode in this taxi, he started taking note of a little girl he witnessed outside the car window. A girl dressed in a red kimono. Such attire certainly stood out in the 1970s as this type of dress was phased out and rather old-fashioned by this point. Sure, an older woman in a kimono would not be too unusual a sight, but a little girl? The taxi continued onward, but he saw her again, and then again, respawning on every block despite not moving. The eeriest part of it all? This girl was making direct eye contact with Inagawa, and her expression. Inagawa described it as dark and filled with some kind of resentment and hatred. When the taxi came to a stop, Inagawa swears he bore witness to this girl levitating towards him, with that grim expression on her face becoming somehow more intense. And then, just like that, the girl was gone. 
Stunned beyond words, Inagawa looked around. Neither the musician nor the taxi driver were reacting in any way. They did not witness the same occurrences that Inagawa just had. They had not seen the little girl in the red kimono. Perhaps Inagawa was just tired, it had been a long day after all. As he finally returned home, he noticed his wife was already asleep. Inagawa decided to do the same. That very next morning, Inagawa's wife had swore she heard footsteps before she went to bed that evening. Despite this, nobody was home and Inagawa was busy working at the station at this time. Once again, Inagawa just shrugged it off. The incident at the radio station was long forgotten later that year when Inagawa received an offer to work as a scriptwriter on a developing bunraku play. Inagawa eagerly joined the production, appearing for his first day of the project filled with anticipation and excitement. But then, just like that, all of these emotions drained from his body, replaced by a heavy, sinking feeling in his stomach. All the heat from his body drained, he felt cold and unable to move. This was as he laid eyes on the doll planned to portray the production's main character. This was the doll of a young girl, a girl that strongly resembled the young girl he witnessed that night in the taxi, down to the red kimono and eerie expression. The resemblance was certainly uncanny, but surely this could be just an odd coincidence. Inagawa decided to once again conclude that it was simply that. With that, he cast his unsettling thoughts aside and committed to the project nonetheless. When Inagawa had first witnessed this doll, it had yet to be completed, the limbs had yet to be attached. The second encounter would involve a visit to the puppeteer's home who was cast to handle this lead doll. This person was referred to as Mayano-san. The doll was now completed, but there was a complication. For reasons unknown to Mayano, the doll had arrived with a broken arm and leg. Mayano swore that he had no clue how the doll ended up this way. When he returned the doll to the maker for repairs later on and even attempted to remedy the situation himself, the arm and leg ultimately became damaged again. The actual cause of damage was never witnessed by human eyes. The doll would just keep ending up like this. The crew attempted to seek out the doll maker one last time, hoping to figure out a way to prevent the doll from breaking yet again. With opening night of the play rapidly approaching, the situation had to be rectified soon. Though, when Maino Inagawa and the others accompanying them had arrived at the doll maker's shop, it was completely cleaned out and shut down. The doll maker had vanished, with no information given on where he left to. He had completely vanished without a single trace. People who created and repaired these types of elaborate dolls were far and few between by that time. Once again, even in late Showa Japan, such things were becoming scarce. The crew didn't have the time or funding to seek out another doll maker. The events that took place following this proved to be even more jarring. Shortly after the disappearance of the doll maker, the scriptwriter tasked with writing dialogue for the play shared some unsettling news. His house had completely burned down. He was able to escape, but the house itself was destroyed in its entirety. The portion of the script that he had been working on was also completely lost. Being long before the days of internet and digital preservation, they simply had to start from the beginning. It was shortly following the setback that tragedy struck yet again. Mayano, the lead puppeteer, shared news that his cousin had passed away suddenly. The official cause of death was unable to be determined at that point in time. His cousin was young and healthy, it was a shock to his entire family. Despite these horrible setbacks, a lot of progress had been made to complete this production. Beyond that, a great deal of time, energy, and of course, money had been invested in the completion and they had to make that money back. For the sake of those working on the project, especially those who needed that money in the wake of their recent tragedies. With that considered, the production team did their best to see the whole thing through, Inagawa doing so with a feeling of dread, still recalling that little girl in the red kimono an image in the back of his mind with each passing day. 
The road to opening night was filled with mishaps. While not as prominent as homes burning down and relative deaths, various accidents came about without any valid explanation in sight. First, lockers filled with costumes would become soaked with water. These lockers were not anywhere near any pipes or water source. Next, other props such as wigs would suddenly catch fire, sometimes while cast members were wearing them. These incidents eventually ended with various injuries to the team. As time went on, Inagawa eventually took note of a pattern in these injuries. Each and every one, without exception, was to a right hand or right knee. Inagawa then thought back to that doll, to the broken areas that just couldn't be completely fixed, especially now that the doll maker was missing in action. The areas broken on the doll were also located on the right arm and right leg. Was this all, really, just a coincidence? At this point, Inagawa refused to believe it as such. This was the final straw. He then tried to persuade the theater group to drop the project altogether. Proceeding could prove to be too dangerous. The others did not agree and did not believe him, feeling the ideas Inagawa presented were too outlandish and that the incidents were merely coincidental. The need to make a profit on this project and see the fruits of all the combined creative efforts were of a much higher priority. And Inagawa, while he didn't agree with these statements, decided to stay on the project as well. He was mainly worried for his co-workers and their safety. Inagawa ultimately decided to press on and see the project to its completion. This brings us to opening night at long last. The sets were prepared, the cast adequately prepared after countless rehearsals. The play was set to debut at noon, but shortly before, cast members began complaining that they lost sensation in their limbs. Some expressed an inability to speak. Despite their best efforts, the play could not premiere as planned and they had to reschedule to the next day. Inagawa decided that he should take independent actions to try and correct the situation, that being the spiritual situation with the doll. Not knowing what else he could possibly do, he visited local shrines in the area and purchased various charms and items that he felt may help. It seemed silly, but at this point, what else could he do? At this point, nothing was happening to Inagawa directly, and he was primarily worried that his fellow team members would get hurt, more than they already had been. This, much to Inagawa's relief, seemed to help. The play debuted without any issue, that is, until the final act. This involved a scene with the doll being placed in a coffin. When the doll was meant to move in the scene, emerging from the coffin, something happened. This was when the crew heard a loud thud, followed by another smaller one. Looking down, they realized all the limbs on the doll just fell off. In unison, without any warning, Inagawa also recalls the entire stage area becoming cold, almost frigid. Some who were present also recall the stage appearing to have a fog over it. According to the cast members, this was not meant to be an effect. They were unclear as to where the fog came from. The play itself was well received, so much so that the producer and Maeno-san became enthusiastic about continuing, and continue they did. During the run of the play, Inagawa received word that his father had passed away. He, to this day, remains unsure if his father's death was actually related to the events experienced during the run of this play, however. And as a side note, Inagawa has been very discreet about the name of this production and where it took place and how long it took place. Photos do exist from behind the scenes, one with the doll Inagawa and Maeno. I can merely only assume that Inagawa is worried for those who seek out this supposedly cursed play. This is why he's so secretive about where the play actually took place and what it was actually called. And at long last, the play finally did conclude, and now came time to decide what should be done with the doll. 
To Inagawa's surprise, Mayano actually agreed to take it. Inagawa thought this to finally be the end of it all, that he could move on from all of this. But this is when the TV appearances came into play. Out of nowhere, Inagawa began to receive calls from television and radio programs. Being in the entertainment industry himself, he was fairly easy to reach. This was no surprise in itself. Somehow, people had caught wind of what happened with the doll during that recently finished stage production. They were fascinated by the incident surrounding the doll and thought it would make for good TV. Inagawa, not having the doll in his possession, passed the message along to Mayano, who was willing to make appearances with this doll. So, there were a couple attempts to film with Mayano and the doll, though at this point, none were deemed useful. These attempts included the earliest of incidents, such as lights falling and equipment not working or turning on. The first attempt is said to have included Mayano at some point mumbling words to the doll, as if he was having a conversation with her. Mayano would later claim to have no recollection of doing this at all. According to Inagawa himself, a film reel of this failed TV broadcast attempt does exist within the studio's vault, which he left unnamed aside from the studio being Tokyo-based. The earliest successful public distribution of the story being told was in Young Lady magazine in 1978. The retelling in print made it easier to get the word out without any slip-ups. And word definitely got out. Following that TV incident with Maeno, Inagawa took the doll into his possession. He decided to go full force with purifying this doll spiritually and found a psychic in attempt of having this doll rectified or cleansed somehow. To Inagawa's bewilderment, the psychic refused to take the doll. She even refused to look at it, claiming it was too evil. Inagawa pressed the psychic to at least try and help with the doll, as it already affected so many people. The psychic then told Inagawa that the doll was definitely cursed. No surprise here. The psychic also shared a rather startling revelation, one received without the psychic knowing any prior info regarding the doll's background. You see, according to the psychic, the doll was possessed by multiple spirits, the most powerful of which being a little girl. According to the psychic, the fate of this little girl in her living life was an untimely death during an air raid during World War II. Her specific cause of death? Complications from losing both an arm and a leg. The psychic did not share anything further. Years later, Inagawa had heard that the psychic had passed away shortly following his meeting with her. Inagawa decided to continue attempting to tell the story to the masses. After all, the doll had still yet to harm him directly, and he felt it was a tale worth telling. The Ikiningyo's most infamous television appearance, one that made this doll well-known throughout the country of Japan, would take place in 1979 during a segment for a daytime variety show known as Plus Alpha. The incidents witnessed during this live broadcast are vividly recounted on sites like Nichan to this day. This incident itself, despite many vivid recollections, only aired one time. It is now lost media. The 1979 incident on Plus Alpha is what truly brought to life the Ikiningyo legend that remains strong to this day as one of Japan's most renowned urban legends. There are people all over the Japanese internet who will defend their accounts of this incident 100%. These separate accounts are all very similar to each other. Found on Nichan, YouTube comments, and even Yahoo Japan Answers, they're all very similar in narrative. The broadcast incident remains lost to this day, though common details shared online are as follows. The Plus Alpha broadcast featured a group of people. This included Inagawa, Maeno, the Plus Alpha hosts, and one other special guest, a renowned psychic. The broadcast was held live, and viewers were encouraged to call in with any questions they had. And it was not long before a high volume of calls were received, all of them asking the same thing. That being who the child next to the doll was. But you see, there was no child. No child was present on the set. 
There are also accounts that claim the child appeared to be on Inagawa's shoulder rather than next to the doll who was on the other side of the room. Clearly, this question confused Inagawa, Maeno, and the hosts. Witnesses even recall that the hosts verbally repeated the question out loud on the broadcast and were visibly confused. As I said, there was no child next to the doll, it was sitting by itself. What most accounts claim to have seen was a young boy standing next to the ikiningyo. It wasn't long after these questions and the confusion that followed that the studio lights began shaking, flickering, and ultimately falling down. According to some, metal poles fell as well, almost hitting the group being filmed. At this point, the show went off air for a bit, attempting to cut to commercials, but the station was having trouble doing so. Some recount an off-air signal being displayed before commercials ultimately appeared. First-hand accounts of those on set at the time claim both the audience and crew were terrified and trying to escape the studio for a short time, that the entire scene was chaos. Yet another claim is that the expression of the doll changed when the show resumed its broadcast. Those who saw it claim the doll appeared angry. It's really not confirmed, at least from what I've read, if the doll's expression change was before or after the cut to commercials. Following this incident, the episode had become somewhat of a taboo topic and never aired again. It's unknown if the film was destroyed, recorded over, or just left in an archive or warehouse to slowly rot away. The thing with film is it doesn't stay preserved forever, so if this film wasn't destroyed in some way already, it will be eventually. So, because this specific episode of Alpha Plus, a show that ran for 10 years between 1972 and 1982, only aired one single time, many simply doubted its existence, thinking it was nothing more than a myth. Though, regardless, and especially after the internet came into play and connected the masses, many swore they watched this segment on TV. And if you're assuming this whole story is a work of fiction with the whole spooky story vibe, well, guess what? Screenshots of the actual TV appearance did actually surface online. Yes, this incident really did happen, and it's well known to many people throughout Japan, even to this day, 44 years later. And these images have been passed around on image boards for quite some time now. There's also a later TV appearance with Inagawa and a replica of the Ikiningyo that did surface as well. Footage of this later appearance can be found on YouTube and Nico Nico. The full original broadcast of that first 1979 appearance has not been recovered aside from these images though. I've said this plenty of time in my lost media videos, but it's worth saying again here. VHS recording did exist in the late 1970s, though was not commonplace just yet. Later on, Betamax recording specifically caught on in Japan, however. This specific tape format does better in preserving media over the standard VHS tapes people were more acclimated to in the West. With that said, later doll appearances being documented are somewhat likely. The infamous one, however, possible but not likely, unfortunately. So, what about these later appearances, and what about the doll itself? What eventually happened to it? Well, as I said, Inagawa made appearances with this doll on a few more occasions following this. Despite the apparent dangers the presence of this doll entailed, TV stations ate the lore behind this doll up, and when it came down to it, the doll made for good TV. And good TV equaled positive ratings and high viewership. Many of these TV appearances can be found online. The way Inagawa discusses his time with the doll is rushed and almost panicked. The speed and cadence of his speech is not something I've personally witnessed with any other native Japanese speaker. <laughs> But let's get back on topic here. What became of the doll itself? Inagawa continued in his pursuit to seek out a way to somehow cleanse this doll of whatever evil spirits haunted it. 
a resolution came sooner than expected. The night after the occurrence at the studio, Inagawa and Mayano visited the home of a friend and colleague, a man by the name Taniguchi. His family ran an inn in Nishizu, a small seaside town in Shizuoka Prefecture. Inagawa and Mayano entered the inn with the doll, and Taniguchi's family, who was greeting them at the entrance, went silent. Upon looking at the doll, it was understood why. The eyes of the doll appeared bloated, the mouth was split apart on both sides, and some kind of sick grin. The hair of the doll had changed color and was standing up as if it was electrocuted. This doll now better resembled a Hanya or Kuchisake Ona, a woman prevalent in Japanese folklore. But rather than turning Inagawa and Mayano away, Taniguchi's wife made an unexpected offer. To take the doll to be enshrined as well as make her a fresh kimono as the current kimono was a little dirty. Inagawa agreed and the doll was left at the Nishizu Inn. Following leaving the doll in Nishizu, things were rather peaceful. Work continued as usual for Inagawa and Mayano even received an offer to perform in a production in Europe. Aside from retelling this tale, this ordeal seemed to be finally behind Inagawa and his peers. This was until news of a second house fire broke out. The victim this time was none other than Mayano himself. He was burned alive. What's odd is that shortly following the receival of this news, Inagawa had spoken to Mayano on the phone. Inagawa would later learn that Mayano was already confirmed dead before Inagawa had spoken to him on the phone. Inagawa believes to this day he was speaking to Mayano's ghost. Following this, Inagawa decided to not speak about the doll for quite some time, to completely shut down any discussion involving it. It was just too painful to revisit after Mayano's passing. This was until years later when Taniguchi arrived at Inagawa's home, insisting to speak with him about it. It took a little while, but Inagawa eventually conceded. This is when he learned that the doll continued to wreak havoc beyond what Inagawa had thought. Apparently, the doll had formed some kind of bond with the young daughter of Taniguchi. The girl began to stay up all night and claimed that the doll spoke to her. This young girl ultimately stated that the little girl haunting the doll wanted Mrs. Taniguchi to be her new mother. This understandably frightened Mrs. Taniguchi, and she expedited the process of enshrining the doll. And by expediting, she did not make the new kimono, she did no more than shove it into the hands of someone at a local shrine, and just wanted nothing more to do with it. Not long after this, a temple priest had contacted the Taniguchi family with the final outcome of this doll. At some point, the doll simply vanished from the shrine. Nobody within the shrine could explain how or why the doll vanished. They just woke up one morning and it was simply gone. Inagawa would tell this tale to countless audiences following this specific incident. He even claimed that the spirit visited his home one last time late at night. As initially, a dark shadow standing right outside his rice paper door. No one was in the house that night, and that shadow was definitely not a simple human one. Inagawa tried to ignore it and just go back to sleep. That is, until the door began to slowly slide open. He could make out a face in the darkness, peeking at him from the cracked door. That's when he realized it. It was the doll, the doll was moving, and she had found him. Inagawa, amidst his panic, wondered if his late friend Mayano had seen this very sight before his house became engulfed in flames and he met his demise. But then, just like that, the doll became a shadow once again, and then the shadow disappeared. This would be the last time Inagawa saw the doll. This was over 35 years ago. It was in 1999, following another television appearance where he discussed the doll, that Inagawa met with Taniguchi's daughter once again. The daughter, now a grown woman, told Inagawa that she had maintained some kind of telepathic connection with the doll and knew where it was, roughly, at all times. She claimed that the doll seemed to be stored away in a warehouse in the mountains somewhere at that time, that time being 1999. 
The daughter left Inagawa with one final message that the doll told her that it would reunite with Inagawa again somewhere, someday. Inagawa asked her to elaborate and she said nothing. Instead, she drew a picture. It was of a stage complete with unique props and lighting. Inagawa recognized it immediately. It was the stage he performed on with Mayano all those years ago. Inagawa would also later discover the whereabouts of that doll maker that vanished all those years ago. He was apparently a monk now, living in solitude. The doll maker's decision to do so was not something any of his peers or loved ones were familiar with, he just simply did it without warning one day. As I said, Inagawa would continue to tell the tale of this doll and the havoc it wreaked on his and his loved ones' lives for many years. Though now he would do so with the replica doll as the current whereabouts of the actual doll were unknown. Perhaps that's a good thing. See, this is why that mid to late 80s television appearance that surfaced online featured a replica doll and a photo of the original doll. Because the true Ikiningyo's whereabouts are unknown. So, the elephant, or perhaps the child's ghost, in the room. There's a huge element of this story that I have refrained from discussing until now. I have already explained that Junji Inagawa is a famous television personality. Appearances on television and working with Japan's entertainment industry was very much commonplace to him. However... One detail I left out, one element of Junji Inagawa's career that he is very well known for, possibly best known for, is that he is a professional ghost storyteller. So famous, in fact, that there is a Japanese ghost storytelling competition named after him. It's called the Inagawa Grand Prix. And that way he talks fast, that kind of panicked way he tells a story that I mentioned previously. It's a storytelling technique that he's well known for. He sold everything from cassette tapes to PS1 games that explore his ghost stories. He even has a YouTube channel he uploads to today. Now, this revelation may deconstruct this whole story quite a bit. However, even Inagawa himself claims this specific ghost story has truth to it. That the horrors he faced fueled his drive to construct and distribute the tale in the first place. Inagawa even states that the tale is a rather difficult one for him to discuss today. And what of the people that supposedly passed on in the tale? Did they really die? That's something that I have personally been unable to confirm. What's also possible is that Inagawa constructed the story from scaled down real events. Perhaps the origin is real, perhaps he still saw that girl's ghost outside his car in the mid 70s. Perhaps all of it is real and Inagawa tells this tale to spread awareness. Perhaps it's not a tale for entertainment purposes, that it's a tale that's cautionary in nature. If this tale is genuine and based on true events, consider this a warning, because that means that the Ikiningyo is out there and nobody truly knows where she is today. Just know, if you ever find yourself in Japan and you come across a doll with this appearance, there is only one piece of advice I could give you. Run. Dolls have been integral to Japan for the entirety of the country's history. They are used to both celebrate and mourn. However, despite all of this, Japanese dolls have also been integral to rituals and curses as well. There are an abundance of tales showcasing the horrors of cursed dolls, as well as many real-life locations associated with them. So today, we're going to take a look at the more infamous ones. Awashima Shrine is a famous location in Japan, located in Kada Bay within Wakayama Prefecture. The shrine itself is dedicated primarily to the god of medicine, particularly in regards to women's health and fertility. For this reason, it attracts many female patrons wanting to get pregnant or wishing for a safe and smooth birth. Despite this, these reasons are not the main draw to the temple.
The primary reason many flock to the shrine is to bear witness to over 20,000 dolls enshrined here, giving the shrine the nickname of the Shrine of the Dolls. The majority of these dolls are Hina dolls brought to the shrine by the former owners, brought forward to be disposed of. Which brings us to the question of why? Why are these dolls left at this temple? Is there something wrong with them? Well, most of them do not carry malicious intent. These are the dolls you can visibly see along the shrine's exterior. The reason the dolls are brought here lies within Japanese culture and appropriate actions to take with dolls. So, allow me to provide you with a little context. According to Japanese folklore and superstition, dolls are objects highly likely to become possessed by a spirit or entity due to their human-like appearance. Some dolls are even made to intentionally resemble a deceased person in order to encourage their presence to return and visit family. So, if a doll is disposed of carelessly by being thrown in the trash or abandoned, it is believed that the doll's spirit will become nefarious and vengeful, seeking revenge and misfortune to those who mistreated and abandoned them. We'll explore some incidents like this a bit later. Luckily, there does exist a way to properly part ways with the doll. This is where Awashima Shrine comes in, as well as the rituals that take place here, known as Ningyo Kuyo. Most rituals entail a ritual cremation of the dolls, while others involve sending Hina dolls out to sea. While Awashima Shrine sits on the coast, the shrine performs cremations on the beach. This only applies to the malevolent, good-natured dolls, however. For what the visitors do not see is the shrine's basement. And located within the shrine's basement are dolls brought to the shrine with Iwakutsuki, or questionable or concerning origins. For that reason, the dolls are not publicly displayed or cremated with the untarnished dolls. This is for the safety of the public and to ensure the unadulterated dolls pass on properly. So, instead, these dolls remain behind locked doors, doors that remain off-limits to the public. Over the years, those who tend to the shrine have witnessed many bizarre occurrences taking place in the basement, such as paranormal activity and one specific doll that has hair that continuously grows. Not to be confused with another famous cursed doll, this one is known as a miniature Okiku, and it was donated to the shrine over 30 years ago, when the family that owned this doll noticed its hair began growing on its own. Ever since that day, the doll has remained locked within the shrine's basement. Those who manage the shrine refuse to show the doll or take it out of the basement at all, claiming it houses a vile and dangerous energy. They also state that the doll prefers to remain undisturbed and untouched in the basement. For that reason, they maintain a safe distance even when in the basement. This next tale involves a Japanese doll, but a more modernized one. This specific doll in question is what's known as a Rika-chan doll, a more westernized fashion doll that's still a popular toy today. Rika-chan was introduced to the Japanese toy market in 1967 by popular toy brand Takara Tomi, back when the company was referred to as Takara Vinyl. Around this time, Barbie dolls were already being distributed in Japan, though not as successfully as in the West. You see, Barbie and her more mature Western styles were often perceived as frightening to Japanese children. For this reason, Takara came forward with their own answer to Barbie with Rika-chan. Rika's soft eyes and modest dress appealed to the Japanese consumer, for the cute and innocent aesthetic has typically been preferred over a womanly, glamorous one. While preference certainly has varied over the years, this still remains prevalent. Rika herself is an 11-year-old elementary school student of Japanese and French descent. She has one older sister and five younger sisters, a set of twins and a set of triplets. She also has three dogs and a parakeet. Though, despite Rika's harmless appearance, there exists a dark story spread among those in Japan for decades now, one that greatly contrasts this doll's sweet image. This is the story of the cursed Rika-chan doll. 
Sometime during the Showa era, there was a mishap in one of the Takada factories. An error that resulted in a batch of new Rika dolls having three legs instead of two. This third leg being muscular and not matching in the slightest. When children received these dolls, not seeing the third leg initially under the packaging, many became upset and even scared. Parents hurried to exchange these dolls for ones that didn't have this jarring error. And this error was later recounted by many people online. These online users claiming that this was a very real mishap and that Takara swiftly issued a recall of the defective dolls. On online forums, some recalled receiving this doll as a child with an extra purple leg. Others claimed the leg had hair, while others recounted it having a texture very similar to human skin. And this is why the fabled Rika doll has been dubbed the cursed Rika-chan. Though, many also claim this, that there was one girl, one that didn't find the defect unpleasant, one who saw her Rika-chan as unique and wanted to keep her. This Rika ended up being the girl's favorite doll, playing with her all the time, buying her new outfits that accommodate the extra leg, and bringing her along on family trips. Though, as the years went on, the girl became a teenager, and soon a grown adult no longer playing with toys. Over this time, she kept the doll in storage, though eventually did come across the Rika doll within a box of her old things. Feeling she needed to get rid of some stuff she had sitting around in storage, she decided to go ahead and throw away the box, her formerly beloved Rika-chan included. Some time had passed, and the woman learned of a phone service that allowed girls to call a number and speak to Rika-chan. This phone service, really just a pre-recorded series of voice clips, made her feel a bit sentimental. Wanting to hear Rika's voice, she dialed the number. And, to her surprise, she heard no voice on the other end. After waiting a while, she hung up, deciding it was just some kind of error. It was much later that night, around 2 or 3 in the morning actually, when the woman heard her phone ringing. Startled awake, she groggily made her way to the front room to answer it. Once she did, she was met with something quite… unexpected. Hi, it's Rika-chan. Gosh, it sure is cold over here. I'm surrounded by garbage and I hear this awful crushing noise. Why did you leave me here? I just want to come home. Thinking this was some kind of bizarre prank, the woman abruptly hung up the phone and returned to bed. The next morning, after waking, another call was received. The woman answered and heard this. It's Rika-chan again. I don't know why you hung up on me last night, but I wanted to let you know that I'll be coming home real soon. I'm on my way. This time, the woman was genuinely freaked out. She yelled at the caller to leave her alone before hanging up. And it wasn't long before the phone rang again. Why did you shout at me? You've never shouted at me. I'm on your street. It really won't be long before we're together again. Don't you miss me? Upon hanging up this time, no words spoken, the woman rushed outside and looked around. She saw nothing down the street and rushed back inside, making sure all doors and windows were locked. She closed all her blinds as well, unsure who was responsible for this sick joke. Soon, the phone rang yet again. The woman answered with trembling hands and shouted at the caller to stop harassing her, to just leave her alone, that this joke went on long enough. Open the door. And after hanging up this time, the phone rang again, immediately. The woman ignored it this time, terrified, but it never stopped ringing. After five minutes, maybe even ten, she answered the phone one last time. When Nika spoke this time, she said this. Hi, it's Nika again. I'm right behind you. Manenji is a long-standing temple with a lot of history, being established hundreds of years ago and sits in the mountains, far away from most civilization. 
Getting there in itself is quite the challenge, as there are no bus stops nearby, and without your own method of transport, you'd have to pay a great deal of money in cab fees. That is, if it's not snowing. Being in such a desolate mountainous part of Japan, the snow makes the roads impossible to traverse during harsh winters. In addition to all of that, the temple is not open to the public and visitors are not encouraged. Nowadays, a form is required just to grant access to the property. With all of that considered, it's clear to see that Manenji Temple does not want people physically traveling to its location, and that location is one far away from most towns and cities. Is there a reason for this? While the temple wasn't erected in such a desolate place intentionally, the location now serves as ideal. This is because one of Japan's most fear-inducing objects is held within this temple's very walls. For almost 100 years, the shrine has been home to a peculiar doll, one that is said to grow human hair at the rate of a three-year-old child, completely on its own without any reason as to why it does so. Some even say she grows human nails as well. Both hair and nails needing to be trimmed routinely by the temple priests. This is, according to stories and eyewitness accounts, a task that has been carried out for as long as this doll has resided at Maninji. This doll is Okiku, arguably Japan's most infamous doll. Out of all the horrific doll stories to grace Japan, none are as infamous and well-known as the tale of Okiku, a tragic yet somewhat terrifying tale that has been told many, many times in the past. So, in an attempt to not give you guys the same song and dance, allow me to present my own retelling of the tale of Okiku. The year is 1918. A 17-year-old boy named Ekichi Suzuki was visiting Sapporo to see a marine exhibition. During his trip, he visited Tanuki Koji, a famous shopping street within the city. It was here, displayed within a shop window, where he noticed a beautiful porcelain doll. This doll was about 40 centimeters tall, that being around 16 inches. Her eyes were a deep and beautiful black color, and her hair was styled in a neat bob cut, uniform and not reaching past her shoulders. Not a single hair out of place. The doll was dressed in a beautiful red kimono. Ekichi was immediately drawn to the doll and wasted no time in buying it. Following the exhibition, after returning home to his small hometown, he gifted the doll to his younger sister, a two-year-old little girl named Kiku. Kiku was immediately taken by this doll as well. It wasn't long before Kiku had decided to name the doll Kiku as well. Kiku loved her doll and she played with it every single day. Doing absolutely everything with this doll, it never left the little girl's sight, throughout the good times and the bad. With that said, it was only a year later, when Kiku was only three years old, that she fell ill. What initially seemed like just a cold only worsened as time went on. The little girl's doll remained at her side throughout everything. Up until Kiku's tragic passing from her illness in the year 1919. The family was stricken with grief, to say the least. Struggling with the reality of losing their beloved daughter at such a young age before Kiku could truly grow up and live her life. All the family could physically attribute to Kiku now was her beloved doll. Initially intended to be laid to rest with Kiku's body, some confusion during the funeral proceedings resulted in the doll not being laid to rest at the gravesite. So, instead, fully intending to treat the beloved doll with respect, the family placed Okiku within their home's altar praying to the doll every single day in hopes that Kiku's spirit will pass on peacefully. While one could hope for this outcome and some kind of closure and resolution to the family's misfortune, things did not end there. After some time, the family noticed that the blunt short hair of the doll was somehow becoming longer. Longer and more unruly, losing the original uniform straight shape. As time went on, the hair only grew longer. Just like a real child that had their hair growing and not styled or brushed in any way. 
The family, while surprised and confused by this, did not wish to get rid of the doll. This phenomenon was not something that scared them. While the hair growing from Okiku's head was jarring, the doll didn't cause any trouble and did not have any nefarious intent. However, they eventually concluded that Kiku's restless spirit, not wanting to pass on, may have possessed the doll. After all, it was her absolute favorite thing in this world. With this in mind, the family continued to pray to the doll every day, grateful for Kiku's presence still being with them in some way. It was much later on, almost 20 years following Kiku's passing, when the family was preparing to move outside of Japan. While they had continued praying to Okiku each and every day without fail, they didn't feel right about taking the doll with them. Feeling as though the doll retained its supernatural ability to grow hair due to being in close proximity to Kiku's grave. Perhaps part of them also felt that Kiku's doll should be in the care of a temple so that her soul could finally be at peace. With all of that in mind, in 1938, the family left Okiku in the care of a priest at Maninji Temple before departing. Though, they did warn those there about the growing hair so that there wouldn't be any surprises. After some time, the original priest was able to confirm this himself, and in the many years since, the temple has done well in keeping their promise and caring for Okiku just as her family had. Whether the girl's spirit or just a portion of her influence causes Okiku to grow hair, who is to say? The temple adorns Okiku's shrine with photos taken throughout the years, all of which show the doll with different hair lengths. According to the shrine, a sample of Okiku's hair was once tested by a lab as well, with the results indicating that the hair is the same in structure to a human female child. They also included that the rate of the hair growth was akin to a young girl about three years of age. It is completely unknown how much truth there is to this. However, the legend of Okiku remains prevalent throughout Japan to this very day. Much like many other island villages throughout Japan, most notably the famous Cat Islands, Shigoku was once thriving with a rich community. The story often remains the same for these small locales. Places that were once thriving and prosperous, later seeing their population slowly leave for the mainland or seek out more opportunities as the years went on, eventually leaving no one and becoming a ghost town. Nagoro is a village that sits in Ia Valley, a desolate location surrounded by mountains. The village itself was never exactly booming, having only around four or five hundred residents at its peak. This is far from today's numbers as the village had a population of just 35 in 2015 and 27 in 2019, with the number likely being even lower today. As people both left and passed away, it brought a lot of dismay and sadness to one of the town's residents, this resident being Tsukimi Ayano, a woman who was born in the area. While Ayano moved from Nagoro as a child, she had returned to care for her elderly father in the early 2000s. Noticing how abandoned the village had become over the years, she decided to memorialize the life it once held in a rather unique way. It was in her own father's likeness that she created her first doll. A doll not made from porcelain or in the resemblance of any smaller traditional ones one may picture in their mind. Rather, a life-size doll made to resemble a real person. This first doll was placed outside to appear working in a field, a sight that was once common in Nagoro. It wasn't long after this that Ayano felt this doll filled a void, and its presence was somewhat soothing. People using dolls to cope with grief and complex negative emotions is actually common and effective. Dolls have been given out to help nursing home patients in coping and encouraging a positive mental state. In addition, women who have suffered miscarriages and stillbirth or struggle to conceive in general will often purchase realistic baby dolls referred to as real dolls to nurture and love as if they were their own baby. Ayano's joy in seeing that first doll out there in the field urged her to continue, deciding to make a doll in the likeness of every former village member who had moved away or passed on. The one she remembered, that is. 
Decades passed, and Ayano continued to make these dolls as more and more people left or passed on. Eventually, Ayano finished 350 of these life-size human dolls, most of which being based on real people, both alive and deceased. These dolls decorate every facet of this abandoned village. Couples on park benches, families outside on the front porch of now-empty homes, women outside farming and men fishing, each scene really creating a time long past, a time the doll's creator greatly longs for. Looking up Nagoro Village on Google Images will yield many unsettling image results of the village and the dolls. To those unfamiliar with the village's backstory, these images are quite haunting. And as the years went on, Nagoro faced yet another devastating blow. The final two students and the final two young people in the entire village had graduated school. This meant no more students to teach, and the school had no choice but to permanently shut down. With this, the few left in Nagoro decided to come together and help somewhat, creating a student body of dolls to decorate the schoolhouse with. Two of these dolls made to resemble the two final graduates. Walking through this village, a completely barren village with no people, only dolls, is quite unsettling without understanding the context. And there may soon come a time when no villagers remain within Nagoro, when the only memory left behind will be these dolls, a lonely glimpse at the vibrance Nagato once had, something that may never be seen again. Sometimes described as the Chucky doll of Japan, the story of Noroko is one similar to Okiku, but far darker in nature. While Okiku is a doll treated with respect even to this day, and said to house the gentle spirit of a young girl who was loved while living, this is not the case for Noroko. Noroko was a woman who lived during feudal Japan. She was said to be unparalleled in her beauty, and truly beloved by the community. She was sought after by many for her beauty, though some seeked her out for different and unexpected reasons for her beauty eventually caught the attention of a Buddhist sect. This sect invited her to stay the night at their temple, treating her with the utmost hospitality and an expensive meal to warm her up to them. That night, as she slept, one of the priests snuck into Noroko's room, using a cleansed sacrificial knife to strike her through the heart. Immediately following, the priests gathered to perform a long band fertility ritual, smearing her crimson blood across every last inch of the doll's surface. This is said to have attached Noroko's soul to this doll, and Noroko herself, having never been able to marry one of her many potential suitors or bear children of her own to carry on her beauty, became angry, vengeful, and aggressive. Her spirit, bound to this doll against her will, darkened with an energy too strong for those living to contain. The doll continued gathering dark energy as the years passed by. This doll, having been passed from owner to owner for hundreds of years, is said to have caused mishaps to everyone who has obtained it. Today, it's said to exist within a vault or storage facility of some kind, owned by a wealthy private collector. First-hand accounts describe this doll coming alive and becoming active in the dead of night, always at the same time each night. This time is when Noroko is speculated to have been wronged by that temple, all those years ago. Some even say that the wealthy collector was ultimately the victim of the doll's wrath at this hour, and that's why the doll now sits in storage. Wadaningyo, meaning straw doll in Japanese, were commonplace in ancient Japan. These are dolls never meant to use for celebrating or playing with. Similar to the Western concept of a voodoo doll, Wadaningyo are created for ritualistic purposes. This brings us back to Japanese beliefs regarding spirits and dolls. Dolls with humanoid likeness are believed to be capable of housing a lost or distressed human soul due to their likeness matching that of a real human body. For this reason, Wada Ningyo were created with the intention of intentionally attaching these spirits and capturing them. 
the target typically being evil spirits. Waraningyo are often created then left outside, around the perimeter of homes and shrines, and even along roads and trails. This is meant to encourage spirits to inhabit the doll and prevent them from causing harm to others. One recorded instance was lining a village road with Waraningyo to protect a village from spreading plague. As nefarious entities were thought to be at fault for rapidly spreading illnesses, these dolls were considered highly dangerous after their purpose was served. These possessed dolls were ultimately dumped into rivers to purify and remove the spirits, though this was not the outcome of all Wataningyo. Some were used with malicious intent when performing rituals with the intention of cursing. This type of dark ritual requires human hair, and the doll itself has to be constructed in a way that differs from the other Wataningyo. These rituals were quickly made illegal, as was the construction of these types of dolls. And who's to say how much damage these dolls have caused? The lore behind this one isn't as creepy as you'd think, but gosh dang is that image unpleasant. Kachan is a term of endearment for someone's mother. It's short for Okasan, which means mother, but can only be used if it's your mother and you're addressing her. In any other context, the word for mother is haha. The origin of the Kachan ID photo image is from a thread where someone faxed a photo of their mother and it came out looking very creepy and unsettling. For this reason, Kachan's ID photo is a somewhat popular horror image in Japan. To my knowledge, the OP claims the photo came out looking like this because they selected a monochrome setting on their fax machine. Pretty gnarly, but also very fascinating. Fukushi Masaichi was a Japanese pathologist who honed his studies in on research pertaining to pigment in the skin, as well as cancers and diseases that relate to it. Masaichi was very passionate about the action of tattooing, from a scholarly standpoint he did not have tattoos himself, and hypothesized that inserting pigment could possibly treat certain types of STDs such as syphilis, as well as thyroid issues. He actually ended up being correct about the syphilis part. Motivated by his studies, Masaichi began a lifelong pursuit of obtaining tattooed skin to study. How did he achieve this? Well, he reached out to many Yakuza of the time and brought forward an interesting offer. In exchange for the donation of their skin after death, Masaichi would provide funding and assistance in completing their elaborate body tattoos. One particularly striking set of imagery from this study are these two pictures. Notice the tattoo of one of the Yakuza pictured. Years later, this photo was taken of their skin following their death. After making this conclusion, I myself could not help but get chills. The tattoos were once held at a public exhibit within the University of Tokyo. These specimens are no longer available to view by the general public due to the prioritization of preserving the specimens themselves. In addition, because this study had begun prior to World War II, some of the samples that were collected in the early days of the study were destroyed due to bombings. That means these skins were lost and never preserved at all. Though a good number were obtained in the years following the war. As somebody who does not have tattoos themselves, though is fascinated by Japanese Irezumi tattoos and how the Yakuza uses them to symbolize certain traits of the person who possesses them, I do find this very interesting, though searching these images up and actually seeing them for the first time can be a little jarring. Masaichi passed away in June of 1956 at the age of 78. Fukushi's studies continued beyond his death as his son, who was also a pathologist, continued collecting samples and studying them. Hitogata is a Japanese word that can be used to describe something with a human-like shape and or appearance. The word can apply to many things, including these bizarre cryptid sightings that were observed in Tuchon's early days known as the Antarctic Ningen as well as the Arctic Hitogata. Their entire body is said to be a stark white and they are typically described as being pretty huge, often tens of meters long with rubbery amphibious skin, similar in size and stature to a whale, but humanoid in shape. 
There are accounts that claim to have seen these creatures both inside and outside the water. The earliest recorded thread involving them dates back to the year 2002. This was when photos supposedly taken in Antarctica during a whale research expedition had surfaced. What they ended up photographing, aside from the whales, was also these humanoid large creatures. Following this, other users were able to dig up other unsettling photos of these creatures, all from either the Arctic or Antarctic. Users noticed there were some differences between their appearance based on location. Because of this, the Arctic humanoids became known as the Hitogata, while those sighted in Antarctica were called Ningens. Both of these words mean human or humanoid, and all sightings had a distinct human shape. The popularity and intrigue in this topic existed for multiple reasons. While cryptids aren't anything new as far as urban legends go, it's how desolate and unknown the Arctic and Antarctic regions of the world are that makes it believable and terrifying to many. That includes the vast ocean that exists below the surface in these areas. Very little of these parts of Earth have been fully explored. Undocumented species existing there is very possible. Some felt that these could be human-like mammals that evolved to survive frigid temperatures by growing in size and adopting features similar to seals, whales, and other aquatic mammals found in cold regions. Many took to Google Earth and shared images from the Arctic and Antarctic regions that appeared to resemble the Ningen and Hitogata in the photographs. Now, not everyone was on board with believing that these giant aquatic humans existed in the Arctic, and you know, that's, that's fair. Many speculated that they were just uniquely shaped icebergs or even aliens. Many strongly disagreed with the naysayers though and dug up Ningen sightings and related incidents in the years following. Some incidents dating as far back as 1918. The latest Google Earth find was uncovered in 2016, it appears, and many people believe the Antarctica humanoids still exist to this day. Allow me to introduce you to a little story known as Real. This tale is cited by many as Japan's scariest creepypasta. While certainly a tall order considering the sheer volume of internet horror stories, many swear this to be the most disturbing. And despite that, I have yet to see anyone showcase this chilling tale here on YouTube. And that's where I come in to the best of my ability, that is. So the story is called Real or Riaru, written out in katakana, literally just meaning the word real in English. It originally surfaced one night in 2009 on Tu Chan's occult board. And the poster, the original poster of this story, felt it was more of a cautionary tale and put it out there to really warn people. The original poster claimed in their own experience, there's just some things you cannot get rid of no matter how hard you try. And the story that would follow would be one the readers would never forget. A story known as a Nichan no Densetsu or Legend of Tuchan. So here it is, the legendary Tuchan tale known as Real. Let's get started. The story opens with a young man who has just graduated university. He was 23 years old and had just been hired at a fairly small company. Because this company was so small, he easily got to know everyone and even made a few friends. Among these friends was a man from the Tohoku region. This man knew many people and had done a great deal of traveling in his life. OP refers to the man by using two circles, a common way to omit names yet differentiate people. We'll just call him Circle. Well, Circle liked to scare those at the office with his apparently real ghost experiences. He claimed that most people don't see any paranormal occurrences in haunted ghost spots because they simply don't follow the proper procedures that each entity has a specific way of summoning them and most people just don't get it right. You cannot summon a ghost by simply showing up at a haunted location. OP didn't really take Circle's words seriously at the time, but he didn't have much to do on the weekends in this new town. He also owned a car, which helped him get around to just about anywhere inside and outside the town pretty easily. Most of his co-workers didn't own a car as they just took the train or bus. So, considering all of this, OP decided to take Circle up on an offer to see a ghost in person. 
they decided on a night in August to make it even more exciting, they picked up some girls on the way. Their destination? A test of courage at a haunted location that Circle knew of in the area, only described as a highly psychic location within the original thread. And while the place certainly was chilling, and OP definitely got the strange feeling that someone was there, nothing really happened. That is, until three days later. It was an average day at work for OP. In many Japanese companies, it's customary for the employees to not leave until their boss does. And this typically means not leaving work until 10 p.m. to midnight, pretty late. OP, as well as many Japanese salary workers out there, are often sleep deprived due to this common cultural norm. And OP, feeling especially delirious one night, did something a bit unexpected. While walking by a large mirror in his home's entryway, OP recalled one of the ways of summoning a spirit that Circle had mentioned. Supposedly, bowing in a very specific way for a very specific duration of time would summon a nearby entity. Continuing to feel doubtful about Circle's claims after hanging out at the ghost spot a few days back, OP tried it in front of his mirror, feeling absolutely sure that nothing would come of it. But he was wrong. Because suddenly, to his right, was an unusual figure. The average height and shape of a woman, their hair long and mangled, obscuring their face like a curtain. They were covered in various charms and talismans and appeared to be wearing a funeral kimono. And while it looked like they were standing still, they didn't stay in one place. They hovered and shook, drifting to the left and right in the center of the room. OP was in shock, feeling like his mind was simply playing tricks on him. He rushed to turn the light on, hoping it was just his eyes, you know, playing tricks on him. Well, they weren't. He could see the figure even more clearly now. The figure was pale and gray. They had a chilling blue aura around them, one that made the entire room freezing cold. OP felt as though time had stopped. It very well could have. He heard no sounds. Not even that of his own breathing. Knowing whatever that was in his room was very much real, there was only one thought in his mind now. To escape. He looked down at the work bag he dropped, slowly bending down to grab it. As he did, the entity began to shake more violently, almost as if they were vibrating left and right. The room now felt ice cold. Finally, the man clutched his bag and slowly stood upright, not taking his eyes off the thing in his house. He slowly walked backwards towards the door, and for some reason, he felt like he was being held in place, as though he couldn't reach that door that was typically only three steps away. That's when the entity began muttering something. Now in a full panic, OP ran out the door, finally able to reach it after struggling enough, and he kept running. The adrenaline fueled him, not knowing exactly where he was going. When he finally did stop, he looked around and realized he was about 15 minutes away, inside the Konbini near his train station. OP felt like they were in a daze, still panicked, but oddly calm. More than anything, they were glad other people were around them now. They found that comforting. Not wanting to return home while it was still dark out, OP stayed at a family restaurant until it was morning and daylight had returned. Once it did, OP begrudgingly made his way back home. He got to his home, he opened the door, and it was gone. OP almost felt like an idiot. With how sleep deprived he was and how that thing was now gone, he felt like the whole thing was ridiculous. He then stepped back outside and smoked a cigarette. He laughed to himself, he likely was just hallucinating. He rarely slept these days and this kind of occurrence was something that was unheard of, just something in ghost stories. And so he returned to the room with confidence and opened the curtains. 
But that's when he noticed a puddle of thick slime where he saw the object standing last night. His head turned back to the light switch and he noticed it was also covered in this weird slime. The room also smelled horrible, like something he never experienced or smelled before in his life. So, so it was real. He cleaned up the odd, muddy substance and went to shower. Even after cleaning everything, a horrible smell still remained in the room. He had no idea what to do about the situation, and he just left for work. During his lunch break, he found time to speak to Circle privately about what happened. At first, OP's friends simply thought OP was messing with him. After a lot of convincing, he came around and agreed to come to his apartment with him to check it out. It was around 10 p.m. that night that they arrived at the apartment. The smell was even worse now, and OP then reiterated what happened. He hoped Circle, being the well-traveled guy he was, would know how to fix the problem. He did not. He simply said OP should get the place purified, and that he would tell the situation to a friend of his. And that was it. OP was terrified to stay in the home, and the smell was getting even worse. He ended up staying at a capsule hotel and decided to take time off work. He spent his time praying at any shrine he could find and asking those at the shrine for help. He never received any help from these shrines. Still refusing to return to his home and not knowing what else to do, he returned to his hometown of Saitama to speak to a friend of his grandmother's. Though, this friend was not just any family friend, she was a renowned priestess. One mentioned in textbooks who is renowned for her work and devotion to Buddhism. OP refers to her as Essence. This priestess was called upon by the family before and OP hoped she would hear his story and help him out. As OP traveled further, specifically to his mother and father's home while waiting for a response from Essence, he started feeling a very unusual sensation. As if rope or twine had lassoed him and it was trying to pull him back to his home. It was very uncomfortable and turned painful when he reached for his neck. This was when his neck began to burn. Feeling as though rough sandpaper was repeatedly and aggressively rubbed against it. Wasting no time, OP rushed to his family home, practically running and barging through the door when he finally arrived. His mother came out to greet him, but her happy expression suddenly turned to one of sheer mortification. What happened to your neck? She shouted. OP went to the closest mirror, looked, and began to tremble. This was when OP noticed the aggressively red and irritated rash wrapped around his neck, almost like something was wrapped around it at one point, restraining him. So shaken by the sight, OP ran up the stairs to the family altar, just where he remembered it was. He began to kneel and pray aggressively, both parents rushed in, not knowing what to make of the scene. Their faces flushed with fear and concern as they witnessed their son pray. The mother, phone in hand, called OP's grandmother immediately. OP could hear his mother sobbing in the background as he prayed. As the days passed, OP was struck with a fever. Then, the rash began to bleed. Every time he touched the area, a sharp stabbing pain was felt. Simple tasks like putting on clothes or laying his head on a pillow to sleep for the night were excruciating. Even sleeping was very unpleasant, as OP would dream of a woman in old-fashioned clothing kneeling before him as he slept. This woman would say nothing, but before OP would awake, would stand to leave, bowing in the doorway before seeing herself out. What was even worse was that Essence, the family priestess, was unable to get to Saitama for three whole weeks. At this point, she was elderly and had trouble getting around. She also had other obligations to attend to before going to Saitama, which was some ways away from her shrine. It was on OP's third night back home that he received a call from his friend from work, Circle. 
His friend had apparently been asking around to try and help OP and finally came into contact with a man in Gunma Prefecture. This man claimed to be able to help out for a price. That price being 500,000 yen, about 5,000 US dollars. OP was not making much money at work and didn't have much saved up. Though, he decided this was important and certainly a life or death situation at this point. So, OP agreed. The next day, Circle arrived at OP's family home with a suspicious looking man. This man had to be almost 40 and look like a member of the Yakuza rather than anyone who could help. The man only introduced himself by his first name, Hayashi. What made it worse was that Hayashi admitted that he himself was only a novice, but wanted to help because OP seemed to be in great danger. Hayashi noted that OP was filled with negative energy and that he could potentially be spirited away if nothing was done. When Hayashi took note of the gravity of the situation and how the whole family was involved at this point, he raised his price to 2 million yen, about $20,000 and with knowing no other option right now at this current point, OP and his family had no choice but to agree. Immediately after agreeing, Hayashi began setting up the house for an exorcism, adorning the walls with many talismans, a crystal ball, and a single cup of sake. In Hayashi's hand was a long strand of rosary beads. For their own safety, the family was told to wait outside, and with that, the exorcism began. As Hayashi began to chant, the pain in OP's neck began to worsen severely. But after a short time, Hayashi abruptly stopped chanting. And at the very moment the chanting stopped, OP felt as though something was straddling his waist. OP opened his eyes to see the entity from before, the one that was standing in his apartment. It was sitting across from Hayashi and saying something to him. The face of the entity couldn't have been more than three inches away from Hayashi's face. OP could not hear what the ghost was saying. Though Hayashi was frozen, his mouth ajar with drool spilling out, he wasn't even blinking. Then, suddenly, the ghost vanished and Hayashi was present yet again. As soon as he was, he yelled in sheer terror and fled the house. Not saying a single word to anyone as he got in his car and sped away. OP had no choice at this point but to wait for S Sensei, though he doubted he would survive that long. A week passed and the symptoms worsened. One day, his parents just told him to get in the car. They didn't explain where they were going, but his father kept repeating the phrase, everything was going to be okay. As they drove, OP realized the pain was subsiding in his neck, and he was finally able to relax a bit. He fell asleep even. And eventually he awoke. And as he awoke, he realized that he had been asleep for a whole day and a half. His parents relieved to not see him suffering and just allowed him to rest. OP also realized they were very far away, all the way in Nagasaki Prefecture. They appeared to be at the home of his grandparents. They planned to travel to S-Sensei themselves rather than wait, to demand she help them. Feeling no pain in that moment, OP felt like his hope was suddenly restored. But then, in that very same moment, the pain returned. And something about that very moment and the constant struggle in the weeks preceding this broke OP. That simple, subtle reminder of it drew him into a fit. He entered a sobbing rage, shouting things like, What the hell do you want from me? As his parents and grandparents rushed back to the car, his shouting and panic continued. He finally snapped out of it when his father slapped him right across the face. It was loud and sharp, leaving OP in complete silence. His father had never struck him before. It was at that point when OP realized the great lengths his family was going through to help him, how they were endangering themselves in the process, all because of his stupidity in front of that mirror almost a month ago. OP knew he could never repay them for their help. He apologized to his grandparents for making a scene. 
Later on, the group arrived at the home turned shrine of S Sensei, and OP somehow suddenly felt relieved. As though simply being on the shrine grounds had left him in a complete state of calm. His family went to rest, and OP was left in the care of S Sensei herself. S Sensei then took his hand and said nothing, only after a while asking one thing if he was scared. OP said, of course, of course he was scared. And that was when OP heard a voice whispering in his ear, constantly repeating one word frantically and without any stop or break. The word was doshte, or why. As it repeated, he noticed the kind, warm expression of S Sensei fade into something neutral and unreadable. OP looked to the side where he heard the whispering. He saw the ghost, this horrific creature once more. It was twitching its head to the side, almost like an owl. As it continued chanting, it began turning over the talismans attached to its body and urging OP to look. OP refused. He then squeezed his eyes shut as hard as he possibly could. But that's when OP felt the trickling of blood into his eyes and heard a loud popping noise. This sound startled him, and without thinking, he shot to his feet and tried to run out. But as he hit the wall, reaching frantically for the door handle, blood still in his eyes, he heard an authoritative shout from S Sensei. Not yet. This urged OP to sit back down. He realized the popping sound that startled him was merely S Sensei clapping. As he sat back down and wiped his eyes, S Sensei asked that same question from before. Are you afraid? And once again, OP said he was. Of course he was. But then S Sensei said something puzzling. She asked, why? OP was confused. The sensei then explained that, while the spirit was very powerful, it held no ill will towards OP. The truth was, the spirit was just unrelentingly lonely, and that is why it latched on as strongly as it did. The sheer power of it was what was causing the pain and distress, apparently. The spirit latched onto OP because it sensed he had a kind heart. The sensei then concluded that she would be able to help him, but it would take a while. And then, instead of an exorcism like Hayashi had attempted, S Sensei turned to pray, using kind, loving words in reference to the spirit, praying that they could pass on and enter heaven peacefully. Sensei then made plans to hold a memorial service as well, one to also help the spirit pass on treating the spirit with nothing but kindness. Following this, OP describes being taken in by a large temple that S Sensei was associated with. This is where OP remained for five months. This was in order to slowly ease the spirit to pass on. The rash went away and the spirit was never seen again following this. Though Sensei did tell OP he needed to visit the temple once every month to ensure his safety. For they were not entirely certain that the spirit had passed on. With all the time away from his apartment, OP had no choice but to quit his job and move back home with his parents. When packing things up at his apartment, the one he initially saw the ghost at, his friend met him there and apologized profusely, blaming himself for everything. The two remained good friends and Circle checks up on OP periodically. After a year of monthly temple visits, it turned into visits every three months for the second year. After two years had passed without incident, S Sensei told OP not to worry anymore. But she would like him to come and visit every now and then. And this brings us to the very end of the thread. This is when OP admits to lying about one key detail of the story. They also apologize for keeping it a secret until the very end. You see, the poster of this story, the one who told the tale and posted it to Chuchan, was not OP. 
Or rather, it wasn't the man who endured so much hardship in this story. It turns out, the poster was actually the anonymous friend, Circle, as we've been calling him. Circle wanted to share the story as a cautionary tale, as a means to repent. Because years later, he still felt responsible for the tragic occurrences that fell upon his co-worker and completely tore apart his life. Where that person is now, Circle's co-worker, who is to say? And there it is, the infamous 2chan creepypasta known as Real. A story that terrified many online users back in its day, and probably terrified some of you out there. Sorry about that. Real or not real, it definitely sticks with the reader. I mean, if it is a work of fiction, you know, it's really well written. If it isn't a work of fiction, then... Yikes. There are a lot of very disturbing or unsettling or uncanny images on the Japanese internet. Today, I'm starting a series where I compile those and we discuss where they came from. Without further ado, let's get into it. Here we see an image of eight people on a sidewalk, four on each side, as if they're parting for the camera person to pass. They're standing completely still with their hands at their sides. It appears to be winter or early spring, judging by the coats and layered dress of the people and the lack of leaves on the trees. Oh, also, you may have noticed that all eight people are wearing realistic pigeon masks. You may have at some point seen this peculiar image online. It's kind of a famous point of interest for those looking into Google Maps and all the weird things that are found on Google Maps. So, that's it, right? Well, not quite. Yes, that's where you can find this image, or rather, these images taken by Google, but that doesn't explain everything. And there's an awful lot of stuff here that still needs some explaining. As you theoretically or virtually walk through this series of images, it just gets creepier and creepier. Especially when the bike passes through. Alright, first question. Where? That's easy enough to answer, and you already know the answer since you saw the title of this video and or know what kind of videos I make. That's right, this image was captured in Japan. More specifically, Musashino, a city within the western Tokyo metropolitan area. Great Teacher Onizuka takes place within Musashino, I believe. Paranoia agent as well. More specifically though, actually very specifically, the street itself is along Tamagawa Josui, a well-known aqueduct that spans the city itself as well as Tokyo. The next question is who? This remains a mystery due to, well, the obscure faces of those involved, of course, though the answer to this may be closer than initially perceived. You see, the street is very close to a specialty university. What kind of specialty? Well, this nearby college is Musashino Art University. The dots are kind of starting to connect. So, last question. Why? There are two likely outcomes. One, nearby students were out working on some kind of art piece or film, possibly unaware that Google was coming through that day. Or two, it's just a predetermined Street View prank. Both seem likely, and it's especially likely that the culprits were art students regardless of the reason why they were out there that day. You see, upon researching the art school further, I found that the student body are often represented by pigeon people. It's kind of their thing. Later on, more bird people were discovered on the street view of the interior of a Japanese cafe. Very likely to be the same students seen along Tamagawa Josui, though not exactly confirmed. Now, whether or not there's some kind of deeper meaning or some kind of symbolism here because, you know, art students and possibly an art piece, I'm not quite sure. If you think there is some kind of symbolism here, be sure to let me know in the comments. Also, if you're enjoying the video so far, please consider subscribing. I make a lot of videos similar to this one here. Anyways, this first topic was just a mere warm-up. 
Let's move on to some images that can be described as significantly more unsettling and disturbing. Here we see a pretty concerning sight. Two children looking down from a window. One smiling while the other looks completely emotionless, possibly unhappy or uncomfortable. Behind them is a figure, a dark silhouette that appears to be an adult woman. Her body is void for lack of better words. That is, aside from their eyes, somehow vivid and clearly visible. While the children are looking downward, the form behind them appears to be looking straight ahead, into the distance. They could be contemplating their next action. They could be completely void of thought. Really, who is to say? What may be the most disturbing element of this image is that it just doesn't make sense. The image quality is pretty good. The figure that's by the window is close enough to the window where light should hit their face and you should be able to see their features. At least more than just the eyes, that in itself also doesn't make sense. So, where did this image originate from? I had originally come across this image by chance on Instagram. While I'm sure I've seen it before in the past at some point, this time, scrolling mindlessly before bed, it really stood out to me. I immediately commented on the post, courtesy of an account called Strangest Media Online, you may have heard of it. I wanted to ask if anyone knew the image's official origin, and I very quickly received a response. Google Maps? Well, that certainly intrigued me further. I tried searching for keywords that could possibly tell me more about the image. That's when I received actual coordinates from the Instagram post I commented on. Not wasting any more time, I typed them in. It's what appears to be a wedding venue or wedding supplier within China. I felt my heart sink my anticipation and excitement leaving me. While I was aware of the possibility of this comment being a troll at the back of my head, I couldn't help but eagerly anticipate some kind of hunt for additional images or angles of this bizarre scene. The Google image possibility did make sense. I thought they were truly onto something. Nonetheless, I attempted the street view around the area, but I already knew the truth. Nothing was to be found here, I couldn't even use Street View anywhere in the area. I turned off my computer and ultimately just went to bed. Waking up the next morning, I noticed a few notifications. More replies on that same post on that comment I made. Expecting more trolls, I scrolled through them. After reading through some replies regarding what kind of content I made, I was ready to just put this one on the back burner and not think about it. Or maybe just make my own post asking around later. That was until I found yet another lead. Possibly something that led to the origin of this image. Tales of Terror from Tokyo, known in Japanese as Kaidan Shin Mimibukuro, is a Japanese horror television show that aired from 2003 to 2005. Was this possibly it? Was this where the image came from? This series had shared quite a few stories during its run, but which episode this specific scene was from, if it was even from this show at all, I could not find. I had even turned to reading through the episode listings on IMDb, but ultimately could not find anything. 
Most of the episode listings themselves were incomplete. I had eventually decided to do a reverse image search on the image itself and came across many, many uses of the image. The majority of these being reposts that didn't share the image origin or any further details. Stuff like bored panda compilations and Redbubble selling literal prints of the image. When the drip is immaculate. Yes, bored panda, that is correct. These children are definitely in a predicament. Thank you so, so much for clarifying that. So it quickly became apparent to me that a lot of misinformation was being spread about this image online. For quite some time, actually. At this point, I have absolutely no idea where this image came from. This image was slowly looking to be another Microsoft Bimbos type of situation. People just kept sharing it, and the origins became more and more detached with every repost of it. But... then... I came across this tweet. A tweet saying this image was from this. Futari bochi from Kaidan Shinbukuro. Seeing yet another post saying it was from Kaidan Shinbukuro and also saying the title Futari Bochi, I quickly went to search for the episode in Japanese. But I couldn't find any episodes titled this. I did, however, come across this. So, it wasn't the series Tales of Terror from Tokyo that contained the scene. Rather, it was a movie released based on the series itself, titled Futari Bochi, or Only the Two of Us. Turns out, multiple films based on this TV series were released following the show's initial run. Futari Bochi was released in 2005, and it involves a high school girl and the boy she tutored facing a great deal of negative supernatural attention. The film itself, the second out of five in the series, is a collaboration between people who had worked on both Juon and The Ring series of films. The scene this famous image comes from is seen during the second half of the film. This specific ghost makes appearances in various scenes, though I won't spoil it in the case you want to see the film itself. Utari Bochi is a very well done film and has a lot of very impressive and very disturbing visuals and effects. If you enjoy horror manga or anime, particularly that of Junji Ito, I would definitely recommend Futari Bochi. Next is a rather peculiar image, though not necessarily on purpose. The image is simple enough, a woman sitting on the floor of a Japanese-style bedroom, her knees to her chest and hunched over a bit as she looks directly at the camera very close to the lens. Her hair is very long and appears to be in pigtails. She has a smile. The lighting is also peculiar. It gives the impression that it's nighttime somehow. In the background, you see what looks like a high school uniform on the wall. The perfect balance of lighting, image quality setting, and placement of the girl herself makes this image quite unsettling. First question, when? Clearly, we don't exactly know where this image was taken. However, we can narrow it down by finding the earliest mention and also by the visible surroundings and image quality. It appears this image gained traction on Tuchan in the late 2000s, specifically in the year 2009. This photo is synonymous with other scary images from the site, such as Jeff the Killer and Kawaii Kusasete or Make Me Cute. It's remembered just as fondly as Jeff the Killer and Kawaii Kusasate. It's just as well known. In Japan, this image is often referred to as Aojiroi Bukimina Jose, which means pale skinned woman. It was often altered to look creepier than it actually looks, especially on Tuchan. This image especially peaked on the horror boards of Tuchan in the late 2000s, specifically around 2009. Though, here's the thing. Nobody has ever been able to find the origin of this exact image. People can't even find the original thread that this image was originally shared on. However, according to rumors and legend, this image was supposedly shared on a board with no comment and no elaboration on what the image was. Apparently, the first comment in this thread was just the image and nothing else. This, however, has never been proven and nobody was ever able to find this original thread. 
It was a little later when users began looking into who this person in the photo actually was. Did this girl intentionally want this image to be creepy and off-putting? Were they even female to begin with? We really didn't know that. Users also suggested that the person in the photo was male. This brings us to the question of who. Who exactly were they? Well, there are a few theories. The very first being this person. Her name is Yui Kono. She was active as an idol during the late 2000s, and this theory really gained traction in 2015. The writer of this blog post I found had even mentioned that the eyes and eyebrows especially match up with those of the pale woman image. Now, where is Yui Kono now? Can we simply ask her? Well, she does have an official blog. A blog that does not contain this specific image, by the way. It's very much barren and abandoned today, as her last post was about four years ago. Back in 2009, however, she was very much active and posted many photos of herself and her everyday life. Having been born in 1984 and being around 24 or 25 during the time she was most active, maybe that time in her life has long since passed. She's now 39 years old today, and that idol blog may be just a thing of the past, I mean, blogs in themselves have been slowly phased out over the years. Though, another possibility could be that this photo did exist on this blog at one time, and was removed once Yui saw that people thought it was scary and unpleasant. I mean, not many people would enjoy having that kind of attention and have their photos edited in the way that they were edited. Though, absolutely nothing has been confirmed by Yui, mind you. We have no idea if this is her. While the resemblance is most certainly there, some feel that this pale woman photo may actually be a bassist going by the stage name H.J. Freaks. One of the reasons why users felt this to be the case and suggested it is a bit interesting. Allow me to elaborate. Back in the late 2000s, two anime reigned supreme throughout the Japanese internet. Those being Lucky Star and Keon. Now, why is this relevant? In 2009, H.J. Freaks became popular due to his video covering the song from Kaon. For that reason, he was very well known among 2chan users in 2009. The massive attention on H.J. Freaks, as well as him often cosplaying and dressing in drag within his content, had a lot of people feeling he was the person in that pale woman photo. Even his home and the lighting within his home look similar in the videos. Now, to my knowledge, attempts have been made to contact this basis, and he has never provided a response. It's also worth mentioning that he's from South Korea, and this may be a language barrier issue. Currently, H.J. Freaks is still very much active and has only grown in popularity and renown. He's very highly regarded for his skill as a basis. I mean... Regardless, the mystery of the pale woman remains unsolved. Most people feel the person in the photo is either Yuki Kono or H.J. Freaks. But what do you think? Personally, in my own personal opinion, I feel that Yui Kono definitely looks a lot more like the pale woman, and it would make sense that she would take this image down upon seeing people not see it as attractive or cute. Like, the way I see it is that if Kono really is the person in the photo, she likely meant it to look cute. Like you caught her right after a nightly bath before school the next morning or something. Just candid, like, oh, you caught me, I'm just, you know, in my home after a bath. You know, something like that. The angle and negative space in the photo may have messed with her features and made them look a little off due to focal length, and that's why there's a debate. If this is the case, Yui is probably not proud of that image and wants nothing to do with it. Or maybe it's neither person. Maybe a regular girl, one without any public presence, had sent a candid photo that showed a little skin to a boy she liked. Maybe this is something she's never done before. Maybe that boy ended up being creeped out by the photo because it looked a little off, and decided to send it anonymously on Tuchan. 
Maybe that's the origin of that original rumored thread that only featured a link to the photo and no added info. Can… can you delete posts made to Tuchan? Perhaps the boy felt guilty and deleted that original post they had made. Or maybe none of these are the origin of this image and the original thread just wasn't archived. Really, nobody knows at this point, but I'm kind of banking on the Yuikono theory. If any updates come about, however, you'll definitely hear them from me. Many of you are probably familiar with this image as well, especially if you're familiar with creepypastas. A painting mostly composed of various shades of red and pink, outlined with aggressive black lines and smudges, everything appearing to blend together while also remaining stark and distinct. The subject of the painting is a girl, or perhaps a woman. Her hair is what looks to be in a bob cut with short, choppy bangs. Her expression is… intense, appearing both manic and pained. And this is often all people ever see of this painting, the girl's head. As this specific cropped version of the photo is synonymous with a 1919 poem known as Tomino's Hell, written by the poet Saijo Yaso. Legend claims that the poem itself is cursed that you should only ever read the poem within your mind, for making the mistake of reading it out loud will cause great tragedy to befall you. However, what we're talking about today isn't Tomino's Hell, it's this painting, and a disturbing background behind the work itself. But first, before I explain anything further, allow me to present the painting in full, for this cropped variant is not the full painting. As you can see, there's a whole lot more to it, and it's all just as unsettling. First question to address is who? More specifically, who painted this? While I came across a few posts claiming the artist was unknown, with a bit of digging online, I did find the answer. The painter is a Japanese artist known as Yuko Tatsushima. Born in Tokyo in 1974, they received a degree in art at Joshibi University of Art and Design in 1998, a private woman's art college. It was later on in September of 1999 that the infamous Tomino's Hell painting was created. However, the painting is not called Tomino's Hell and has nothing to do with the poem. The painting is officially titled, Atashi wa mo yome ni wa ikemasen. In English, this means I can no longer become a bride or I can no longer get married. While what exactly is being depicted isn't confirmed, it's easy to infer the general idea. Tatsushima has created a number of incredibly provoking Gudo pieces that can be found on their official site, most of which I most certainly cannot show in this video, though I'll provide a link in the description if you want to take a look. Tatsushima appears to have been active as an artist from 1998 up until 2009, as that is when the final update to the webpage had taken place. In addition to painting, Tatsushima had also delved into sculpting and photography. These can also be found on the official site. The homepage itself appears to be very much aware of the influence of I Can No Longer Become a Bride, as it's filled with that infamous headshot. Since the site itself was last updated 14 years ago, it's unknown what Yuko Tatsushima is doing today, or if they're even still alive in 2023. So, a poem written in 1919 and a painting created in 1999. Two works created 80 years apart with no direct correlation. So, how exactly did the two become synonymous? While I was unable to find the very first post with this image or who was the first person to combine the two, it's likely that that person who posted the Tomino's Hell poem online was also into Gudo art. They may have come across the Tatsushima painting while browsing the artist's online portfolio and felt it fit the theme. Simply just that. A cropped headshot of the painting is even present on the artist's site itself, so it may have just already been like that when they saved it. Though, as of right now, I really have no clue. Well, 
what we see here is confusing on multiple levels. The long neck of the woman twisting around is one thing, but the low quality of the image itself leaves for further speculation. The image almost appears creepypasta-esque, if that's even a word. It almost appears to be an image made by someone online just to scare other people online. However, it's still pretty jarring to see pop up on an image board or in image search results. I'm speaking from experience here. It's jarring, but it's also intriguing. So, where did this image come from? One bizarre mention I found online claimed it was originally a Windows 95 wallpaper. This is apparently according to a Chad Tronic video, though I myself was unable to find the actual video uh, where he said it was that. This knowledge did end up leading me to the actual origin, though. This is because Chadtronic's channel is known for reacting to a specific thing, or a specific genre of thing, that being cursed commercials. So this image comes from this rather uncomfortable advertisement. While what's technically depicted in this ad is a woman with a very long neck, she's technically a yokai prominent in Japanese folklore known as a rokuro kubi. The most prominent kaidan or ghost stories that feature these yokai originated in the Bunka era, that being only between 1804 and 1818. These stories are often quite bizarre. The most popular story involves a female escort after their client falls asleep. Once asleep, legend says the Rokuro Gubi will stretch their neck out and lick the oil from paper lanterns within the surrounding area. Folklore also states that women often become Rokuro Gubi due to illness. So I'm not sure if this is meant to be a cautionary tale to not seek out paid female company, or what. It's certainly more bizarre than scary, in my own opinion at least. This begs the question though, what is this advertisement even for? It's stated pretty directly at the end of the advertisement, it's for an entertainment magazine geared towards men called Takarajima Magazine. At first glance, they seem to be focused primarily on underground and visual K-band news, at least this one 1990 issue I could find and actually read is. It even discusses hippies and psychedelic music. With that said, it's definitely appealing to an underground scene. In general though, according to the Japanese Wikipedia article, the magazine presented niche subculture news, a lot of really underground stuff that would cater to a very, very specific audience. This magazine has apparently even talked about psychedelic drug use and spirituality, definitely not something mainstream Japanese media has ever wanted to showcase to the public. The content within Takarajima magazine is definitely very interesting and very useful to know the non-mainstream side of Japan during this time period. However, with that said, this makes a television spot for such a publication even more interesting. Takarajima itself means Treasure Island, by the way. It also brings up food chains and literal island names when searching Takarajima in Japanese. So when exactly did the ad itself air? It is in black and white and appears old at first glance. This can be narrowed down a bit when looking at when Takarajima was first introduced and when it was unfortunately discontinued. 1973 to 2015. Actually, that's a pretty wide margin, but a margin nonetheless, I can work with that. So the magazine was actually referred to as Wonderland Magazine throughout the 1970s, so that actually cuts out that decade for the most part. Also, the magazine made some changes in the 1990s due to poor sales throughout the 1970s and 80s. These changes included the addition of an adult entertainment section. This section of the magazine was discontinued in the year 2000, however. For that reason, I feel this ad likely aired sometime in the 1990s rather than any time earlier than that. The scandalous adult origins of the Rokuro Kubi herself, as well as what the magazine was showcasing at this time, and the audio and video quality of the ad itself despite being in black and white also suggest to me that this was made probably in the 1990s. Yes, it is in black and white, but the visual effects you see in this ad aren't something you would see in the 1970s, at least in my opinion. All of that aside though, this commercial is pretty cursed.
this image is one I have seen many, many times on the covers of these cursed image or scary internet thread or horror story books you see at like Japanese convenience stores. They're usually sold for like 500 yen and are kind of clickbaity. Regardless, this image is related to a few things in Japan, one of them being a supposed real event or events. This brings us back to those creepy image books we've discussed. I've seen this image on the cover of more than one of these cheap, almost clickbaity kind of Japanese books. They're often sold at convenience stores. This specific book with the image on the cover didn't even have the story behind the image inside the book. Nothing about it at all, actually. Nothing about any of the images on the cover, actually. Despite that, a reverse image search led me to a 2020 5chan thread. For those unfamiliar, 5chan is the successor to 2chan. 2chan, in its original form, has been offline for almost a decade now. The thread itself discusses scary things one may encounter when moving out on your own and living alone for the first time. Or just living alone in general. Many people in the thread shared real things they had experienced happening. And because this thread was active during a time when everyone was distanced and isolated, it adds to the general unease. While one may assume there is the usual thoughts one would have, such as becoming sick and not having any help to take care of yourself, and also just being lonely, this thread got a lot more disturbing than that. The specific post that used this image was actually in response to a conversation two others were having. A user mentioned that a hole in the roof of their bathroom had suddenly opened one night and a person was looking in at them from their ceiling. Another user replied saying that that happened to them as well, but with the letter slot at their front door. The response to both just said, like this, that's scary, and attached a link to this infamous image. Nobody like that. While this thread is somewhat well known, this was not the first use of this image, making it definitely not the origin of the image. As I continued my search, I found this tweet dating back to 2014. The caption basically says, You gotta stop rolling up these flyers and putting them in my mailbox like this. It includes the photo. Interesting thing about this post is this image includes a watermark on the bottom right of it. The watermark says mop.com. Directly searching the URL doesn't seem to bring up the site for me. However, with a little research, I learned that Mop.com is a popular entertainment forum that has been running since 1997 in China. So, with this watermark attached, that means the origin of this image could go back farther than 2014. However, with Mop.com not loading on my end and what looks to be some trouble the site got into with the Chinese government in 2009, I am not even sure if I can manually find this image and its origin at this point. That's assuming if it actually did come from mob.com. And thus, I continued searching. And I found this. A Japanese blog post from the year 2012 with two variants of this image. The caption reads, The leaflet in my apartment mailbox is scary. That is unfortunately all it provides though. What is interesting though is there are two separate variants of this image from different angles. In addition, that mop.com watermark is on both images this time around, leading us back to mop.com. And as of right now, this is the earliest mention I can personally come across, which leaves us on a bit of a cliffhanger for now. However, it is possible that this is the earliest mention and that this blogger just decided to upload the image to mop.com to get it online, kind of like with Photobucket or Flickr. Using an image hosting site was still somewhat common back then. I have attempted contacting the blog in hopes of finding more info on this specific mystery. I did also contact one of the Twitter users that used the image. For now, especially being unable to access mop.com and really figure out what the site's all about, this is where I'm left at with this search. There are a lot of images that originate from Tuchan that are nothing short of uncanny and creepy. The Make Me Cute or Kawaii Kusasete image is one of the infamous images that originated from Tuchan on their boards. One that amassed fame for totally unrelated reasons outside of Japan, such as within creepypastas and horror games. This image is often referred to as a Hennebarbus Hennicide, whatever the heck that means, that name did not originate in Japan. 
The origin of the image itself is not from a creepypasta either. This uncanny nightmare fuel actually saw its first appearance on a 2chan board with no creepy story attached. Instead, the poster who attached it gave forth a challenge to try and make this unpleasant image into something cute and endearing. And people did try and make this image cute, and the results really varied. The Make Me Cute thread dates back to the year 2004, that iconic year in 2chan history I mentioned before. That rhymed, I didn't mean it to rhyme, but it rhymed. There's also the text attached to this image. It's basically a chain letter. If you're an aging millennial like myself, you may remember the era before smartphones. When you didn't have folders or chat logs to keep track of text messages. They all just piled together like an email inbox. It was awful. Also, the cameras were really bad, but golly did Motorola razors sure look cool and fancy back then. Anyways, back in this era, every now and then, I would get these annoying texts. Chain letters that said something like, Don't delete this! Forward this text to 15 people or your crush will hate you and you won't be attractive and oh also you'll die in 7 days so you better forward this to 15 people! TLDR, this image is basically that with a spooky image attached for good measure. This specific image with the text was likely used in email chain letters as it was 2004. However, earlier versions of this image may have existed in 2chan as well. Like Jeff the Killer, this image was clearly modified from an original image. There have been a number of searches trying to find the origin of these legendary creepypasta images. This one did see a great deal of developments, with an old photo of a Meiji-era doll found to likely be the original image. This original image likely originated from an auction site listing. I don't want to get too into it myself. Plenty of other YouTubers have made videos on this topic that far surpass what I'd ever do on it. I've even helped with one of said videos a little bit. This specific Make Me Cute image in its infamous state did surface on Tuchon and is considered somewhat of a nostalgic sight to many at this point. Which is kind of funny with how it's supposed to scare people and stuff. At least back then it was supposed to, you know. Now back to something a bit more disturbing. It was in the year 2006 that a sudden and unusual post had surfaced. The post was by a man claiming that they had hidden 50,000 yen somewhere within Tokyo. This is less than 500 US dollars, give or take the current exchange rate. This poster claimed that they had seen previous users claim to hide money within the city, though these ended up being fake, made by trolls as LARPs. This poster wanted to hide the money for real and see what happened. To spice things up, OP stated that the users only had that one day to find the money. Well, technically, it was less than a day. This post was made around 2 in the afternoon that day, so it was more like 10 hours. But yeah, if nobody was able to find this money, the OP would come and retrieve the money at midnight and call the whole search off. They did end the initial post with this sentence. I will respect whoever is able to find the envelope. Hints were promised to be posted throughout the day. The first one was given right away. The clue was in code, deciphered and found to be in a primitive form of kana input that spelled out Akihabara. The second hint came later on that day. This hint was far more cryptic, only being the number 11. While most were confused and requested more information, one poster had come forward claiming they already found the envelope and that this envelope had no money in it. That the money itself was either found by someone else in Akiba at some point, or that the OP was just trolling. The OP, however, just told others to pay this person no mind and keep on searching. Things only got more strange from here. About two hours after the search had started, OP decided that they should go and check the physical location to see if the money was still there. Turns out, according to OP, the money was gone. But then, OP said they were going to look a bit more and see if the money was moved somewhere. A little while later, OP claimed to have found the envelope of money after all, stating that original spot was so dark that they simply missed the envelope when looking the first time. And this was when OP began insulting the other people in the thread, mocking their intelligence and claiming he felt they weren't smart enough to actually solve that second riddle this second riddle still being just the number 11. 
OP then began demanding that people start proving they were able to solve the riddle, in order to prove that they were smart enough. If they failed to do so, OP threatened to just give the money to a homeless person. But then, only a short while later, they returned and said they lied about finding the money and that it actually was still missing. Then began ranting about how it must have been a homeless person who found the money. That a homeless person could find the money, but the Tuchon users could not. Now, maybe OP was upset with how things ended and that this somewhat large amount of money was missing without any explanation, without anyone saying they found it. This was the point when their behavior became even more concerning. When they decided to now hide 10,000 more yen in Akihabara and start to search over. 10,000 is about 100 US dollars, by the way. But this was when more and more people were losing faith in OP and the story they were telling. Saying that OP likely didn't want to give away that much money and took 40,000 yen back to keep for themselves. But then OP came back and was like, you know what, yeah, I did take back my money. It wasn't a homeless person and it wasn't missing. I just took it back and lied because you all weren't smart enough to solve my riddles the first time. OP then claimed to have put back the 40,000 yen where the 10,000 yen was. Thus, having 50,000 yen hidden in Akihabara once more. You... You guys still following me here? I, I sure hope so because this was when the posts became even more unhinged. With OP claiming that while the money was there now, they may just decide to go and take it all back again if those searching weren't smart and quick enough. Honestly, at this point, if I was in this thread, personally, I would have just been like, okay, this person's a little unhinged and they're probably trolling. This... this ain't worth my time. Though, many in this thread saw it very differently. They saw OP's taunts as a challenge and they accepted said challenge, not liking the insults they were receiving from OP and wanting to prove them wrong. As time went on though, more people lost hope in this whole thing and the thread just turned into an argument regarding if anything OP said at all was real. But then OP returned yet again and provided some disturbing details. According to OP, yes, they did lie about hiding the money yet again, but then claimed that they did hide something that first time around, but they never said it was money. Looking back at the very first post, they did say 50,000 was hidden, but they never said 50,000 yen specifically. OP then claimed that the envelope instead contained... cockroaches. They then stated that the 50,000 yen was still hidden somewhere in Akiba, but it was not in an envelope. It was just money that wasn't in anything at all. Okay, okay, let's pause. Now, there's no way 50,000 cockroaches were inside an envelope, that's just not physically possible. OP likely saw that they didn't put yen in that first post and went with it as a cop-out. Probably. Possibly. Them taking and putting back 40,000 would only make sense if it's money. Either they're trolling or backing out or just LARPing and seeing how far they can get with this whole thing. But... I don't know, man. See, the final outcome is more disturbing than that. Let's continue. More and more readers became outraged, which is only natural at this point. The outrage turned into more arguments more than anyone actually trying to solve the clues. Like the kind of arguments you see your uncle have in political Facebook posts or groups, or just any argument on a controversial YouTube video that that works too. And OP became increasingly annoyed by the lack of cooperation and eventually snapped. They broke the already present chaos with a long block of text reading, Ooh, ya, 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 which is supposed to be interpreted as a menacing antagonistic laugh. This thread is often referred to as Ooh, ya, ya among those in Japan, as this was a very pivotal moment within it. What they said next placed this thread in 2chan infamy. You all should be glad you never found that envelope. Those present began taking the words of OP seriously once more. What exactly did they mean? Some went back to the original few posts. Upon doing so, they found a play on words. When OP wrote, I'll respect the person able to find the envelope in Japanese, they wrote it in a rather interesting way that can be read as a pun. You see, it contains characters used that can also mean... I'll terminate whoever finds the envelope. 
After that, all the OP provided was more ominous laughing. Now, remember all the mentions of homeless people in the thread, specifically by OP themselves? Days later, according to People Online, a homeless man was found deceased in Akihabara. It's unclear how they passed or what happened, but a lot of people were talking about how a homeless person was found. Was this all a coincidence or was OP at fault? We may likely never know. This is a very disturbing 1920s kamishibai, 1980s manga, and 1990s anime film. Oh, and there's also a recent live-action film, not really sure how they made that work. This work is so disturbing, in fact, that the animated film is banned in Japan, to an extent, and also started a TikTok trend where people just warn you not to watch it because of how horrible it is. Shoujo Tsubaki, also known as Midori, is a very well-known eroguro piece, this word, eroguro, being a genre of erotic gore anime. The subject matter of this anime actually caused Hiroshi Harada, the creator of the animated film, to experience great difficulties when looking for funding assistance to produce the work. In short, nobody wanted to fund an anime with such unnerving subject matter. This ultimately resulted in them using their personal savings to see the project through. This subject matter is truly filled to the brim with things many find quite disheartening. The film begins with an optimistic, young, underage girl named Midori. She leads a normal life and it's void of any trauma and hardship until tragedy strikes when her father leaves. Her mother becomes ill and Midori takes to selling flowers on the street. From here, she meets a man who offers to help her if she ever needs it. Following this, Midori returns home to find that her mother has passed on. Midori then finds the man again at a circus that he runs. From here, some really horrible abuse scenes take place involving Midori and the circus workers. Midori joins the circus and later meets a much older man who basically grooms and marries her. These scenes are pretty disgusting. Midori begins attempting to stand up for herself around her abusers at the circus, which does not end well at all. Midori's husband then sees one of the circus workers confess their love to Midori, which I remind you is a child. Midori witnesses her husband murder this man, which results in Midori losing her trust in her husband. This then results in more abuse towards Midori. The film ends with the husband and Midori leaving the circus and Midori eventually being left alone again as the husband is murdered shortly after them leaving. This is when Midori finally reaches a breaking point and enters a state of insanity. The end. Some have suggested that Saki Sanobashi, that supposed lost deep web anime, to be Shoujo Tsubaki. It really does not have any similarities other than it being Guro, so I don't see why it was ever suggested to begin with. I personally wish I didn't watch this film for the sake of this video. It's gross and sad and overall very unpleasant. I don't feel any kind of fulfillment from watching it. I just feel kind of empty. A creepy YouTube video from 2007 that is meant to correlate with the television show Lost in that it was part of an ARG called The Lost Experience. Most of the webpages for this ARG are no longer live, though this video remains up and its spookiness still impactful to the point where this specific video reached Japan and became notorious in its own right. I personally have seen this visual of the woman and her glitches being used in other videos, specifically on platforms like Nico Nico. The Nevada Town Incident is a very well-known piece of Tuchon lore that has spawned a large amount of fan art, cosplay, and memes. Its popularity has even expanded beyond Japan. This topic, or rather, this heinous and tragic incident is not something to be made light of. Honestly, the fact that the internet found a way to do so is pretty disgusting. 
Nebalatan is in reference to a 2004 murder of a 12-year-old girl in an elementary school in Sasebo, a city within Nagasaki Prefecture. The outlandish nature of the story took Tuchan by storm at the time. Many were surprised at how young the girl was, as well as the gruesome nature of the crime. Having used a box cutter in an empty classroom while school was still in session. The 11-year-old girl, only known by the public as Girl A, acted on this crime because the victim had apparently called her a goody-goody and made fun of her weight online. Further investigation had revealed that the assailant actively consumed gory media and had an unhealthy fascination with it. One example being reading the book Battle Royale and watching its film adaptation. This girl was institutionalized and her real name was never publicly announced due to how young she was. This is where Tuchan filled in the blanks. Users on the internet board actively searched for information on Girl A, eventually finding what they believed to be her name as well as a group photo including her within the school's yearbook. Girl A was wearing a sweatshirt from the University of Nevada, Reno, which happens to be the college I attended. And thus, she was referred to as Nevadatan from that point on. The girl has no affiliation with the university, has probably never been to the United States or Nevada. It was just trendy at the time to wear university sweatshirts. Tuchan continued to dig up info on this girl as well as make memes and fan art. The glorification of unlikely murderers is an occurrence that still comes about every now and then in Japan. This was a thread, well, series of threads, that took place on 5chan fairly recently in the year 2020. While not a renowned Tuchan classic, it's worth mentioning as a little bonus since it's pretty unsettling and interesting. By the way, 5channel is basically the spiritual successor to the now defunct Tuchan. Again, another story for another day, I might get into it at some point, we'll see. As the name suggests, the thread was dedicated to sharing photos that supposedly captured real ghosts on film. This thread's activity came about late at night in Japan. Ghost photos themselves have quite the history on Tuchan. Many renowned photos first made their appearance on the site before going viral and appearing in convenience store books about urban legends or internet mysteries. Some even made their way on Japanese variety shows like Night Scoop. We will be talking about some particularly famous ghost images later on in this Tuchan deep dive series. But here is the thread itself, as well as the scary photos within it. There isn't really a story or any discussion, like I said. Just a bunch of users sharing their creepy, often unexplained, ghost photos late at night. Often without any context, just the image link. It's actually pretty fun going through these ghost photo club threads late at night. A lot of these photos aren't intended to be scary or nefarious. Many are family photos and such, so when you click on one and search the background for the ghost or paranormal activity, you often get a bit of a surprise when you find the ghost. I'll just go ahead and let you guys peep a few. Japan. The year is 1992, 11 p.m. on a Friday night. The popular mystery television show Night Scoop was on. A long-running show that's still on today that solves mysteries provided by the viewers themselves. Each and every mystery being solved, without fail. Tonight, however, was a bit different. As this week's segment came to a close, the jarring and sudden words, investigation terminated, had appeared on screen. This was the first and only time a mystery on Night Scoop was deemed unsolvable and suddenly dropped like this. The one singular time since its premiere in 1988. Why was that? Was there perhaps more to it? Today, we're exploring an unsolved mystery no manufactured can be found on the top of my lid. The way the show tried to confirm this to be true or not true is by the case detective taking flights back and forth between Tokyo and Osaka to try and catch a brief glimpse of the lid. 
not exactly efficient. And then there's their most famous mystery, the infamous case of the missing colonel or the curse of the colonel, a mystery known by many today that actually made its way into the public eye from an episode of Night Scoop. Following the baseball team Hanshin Tigers' monumental 1985 win against the Cebu Lions, locals in Osaka went ballistic, gathering in the streets and generally just raising hell. Among the most outlandish actions included grabbing a Colonel Sanders display outside a nearby KFC and tossing him into the Dotonbori Canal. There's a lot more to the story, specifically why they did this in the first place and the superstitions of the Hanshin Tigers fans, but following the colonel's departure, the Hanshin Tigers began performing miserably. So miserably, in fact, that an 18-year losing streak followed and many attribute it to the enraged spirit of Colonel Sanders. You heard that right. However, finally, in the year 2009, most of the statue was found and recovered, proving the event of chucking the colonel into the river a real thing that, in fact, happened. If you haven't guessed by now, most of the cases brought forward on Night Scoop are rather silly. Even a big scandal associated with the show was very silly in itself, a scandal known as the Pudding Affair. And that's a part of what makes the Nylon Ropes case really stand out. Perhaps the cast and crew thought it was a more silly, lighthearted ordeal that would have a lighthearted resolution when it ended up not having that kind of outcome at all. The mystery itself starts simple enough, an Osaka local wrote into Night Scoop saying that they recently took note of an abundance of vinyl and nylon packing ropes, often used in wrapping parcels for shipment or to mark places for plumbing and construction. These were tied in spots around one of the big stations. This included fences, telephone poles, external plumbing, and other areas where they could be successfully secured around, both large and small. These ties were also varied in color, though there was no visible pattern or correlation with them. This occurrence was sudden and unexplained, having first been noticed around two months prior to writing the letter. The person who requested this mystery never caught anyone actually tying them despite living and working in the area. This was unusual considering the population of Osaka. It's the second largest city in Japan and the areas around stations generate big crowds on the same level as Tokyo, especially during commutes. In short, we're talking about a general metro area of Japan with a population of over 18 million in 1992. The show's approach and procedures to this mystery are as follows. A comedian brought to Osaka named Makoto Kitano was tasked with the field research. He asked people around the area if they knew anything about these ties and who was responsible for attaching them. Assuming these markers could be in relation to plumbing or construction of some kind, possibly for the city, they also called the local police as well as City Hall. Police as well as City Hall denied any association with it and nobody in the area knew of or saw anyone doing it. However, the start date of two months ago was reiterated. The investigator then went to various stores in the area that sold these ties, hoping one of them would have a record of a large number of these ties being ordered. This was where a lead was finally discovered. The employee of one store had confirmed that they were completely sold out of yellow and blue vinyl ties because they were all purchased at one point by one person. However, when pressed about who, these shop employees were either unable to pull up any record of the order or outright refused to. After this, the host returned to the site of all the ties and investigated further. It was here where he discovered the ties did in fact have somewhat of a pattern to them when looking on a map and possibly led to something. Perhaps they were used in the same way someone would leave a trail of crumbs or some kind of marker when hiking in the wilderness. The host then decided to follow the ropes from both sides, eventually coming to some end within a secluded alleyway. And what was seen at this spot? More ties. Far beyond what was witnessed before, adding up to hundreds, possibly over 1,000 ties. Yet, that was it. Still no answers regarding to who or why. While the show attempted to remain lighthearted and silly, viewers recalled the scene being visibly different. It was creepy and unsettling. 
The comedian host was appearing to break character, appearing visibly creeped out in some shots. This is where the investigation was abruptly cut short, at least on camera. The rising tension drastically dropped with Kitano's premature conclusion. That conclusion being this case was unsolvable. His only explanation for why being that this case could not be researched further. At the end of the broadcast, unique text appeared on screen. Text never seen in any other episode. This text was a no-nonsense, no-excuse request not to write in about this case ever again. That there will be no further reports or updates regarding this case, at least from Night Scoop. So, yeah, very different in tone compared to the previous episodes of Night Scoop in the four years the show had been on air at that point in time. And, as you could imagine, it really didn't sit well with viewers. The majority of viewers were very confused. For many, this bizarre episode stuck with them for years. And like many bizarre situations and stories observed in Japan, this case was eventually brought forward and discussed once the internet provided the platform to do so. This topic especially took off within the occult boards of Tuchan. Many felt that something supernatural was at play with all the ties, especially due to the pattern they were in, nobody seeing who did it, and the bizarre side of them in general. Due to such interest, a search to find a recording of this episode began. Once that was found and re-uploaded, re-watching the case was still made somewhat difficult. While other Night Scoop episodes are viewable in full on YouTube, some even translated to English, this specific episode is pulled from the internet by the rights holders shortly after any existence occurs online, especially on big sites like YouTube. Those involved with the show did not want this episode to be reviewed, it seemed. The official site also includes zero mention of this episode, though this isn't unusual as there's a lot of episodes. However, removing this specific episode so quickly gave off the impression that the Night Scoop people were trying to cover something up, and that intrigued the fans of the occult boards even more so. Though, that didn't stop forum users and blog posters from getting their hands on the footage online eventually, even though it did get taken down fairly quickly. And when they did, screenshots were taken and the episode was recounted via vivid text description. With my own Japanese knowledge, which is not perfect, far from it, mind you, I'm happy to be able to report that I did find the episode. The re-upload I encountered didn't feature the show's intro or credits, but it does have the complete segment. Honestly, it wasn't too hard to find, and searching the Japanese case title will bring it up. And of course, I can't show too much of this episode due to copyright, but I will show what I can to elaborate points. So, this whole segment is only 13 minutes in length. The message saying that they would not continue the investigation is correct and is in the episode. Here is that specific screen. The wording of it makes it very clear that this investigation was to be abruptly terminated. It appears on screen a bit suddenly, and I can definitely see why this weirded out viewers at the time. Another thing I noticed is that most of the ties are tied very close to the ground, and the majority of them are yellow. The ones in that alleyway are blue. Actual ropes appear to be tied around large objects in addition to this, also very close to the ground. When the host asks that shop clerk about the ties, it's very clear that he is very serious and wants nothing to do with the conversation. The host, Kitano himself, is elated that he found the store the ties came from, but the man running the shop doesn't joke back or smile at all. A few police officers are seen with the same demeanor a little later on when the host tries talking to them. They just walk away. My impression is that they clearly don't see this as a joke either. After this, it cuts to another scene with the host replacing a yellow tie that he removed from a pole at the start of the episode. With that, the text saying not to inquire further shows up and that's it. The act of him putting the tie back is a little odd too, like context is missing here. So, in addition to conversation on forums, multiple blog posts were created as well. Among the most prominent and useful of these being written by a user who claimed to have been living in that part of Osaka during the early 90s, particularly during that incident and Night Scoop's investigation. He was apparently a student in middle or high school and provides screenshots where he's even seen in the background of the show. 
In his post, he recounts all the ties being removed from the area following the show's production crew leaving. They were all just suddenly gone. Very much like the locals interviewed on air, this writer of this blog post didn't know much about the root cause of this and who was doing it. But luckily, there exists another incredibly useful blog post. One that archived a few of the forum posts that I mentioned earlier. This included accounts from locals and a possible conclusion to this bizarre mystery. And before we get into that, there is one rather important topic I'd like to discuss first. This is, unfortunately, a topic filled with stigmas and issues. The Japanese population believes heavily in a person's civil duty, feeling that a member of Japanese society involves a great deal of responsibility from a young age to contribute to the greater good of society as a whole. There are benefits to this cultural approach, absolutely. Japan is a very safe country, and those who live there are very helpful and trusting due to this safe environment. In short, when everyone does their part in a community, big or small, change is seen, simple as that. However, an issue that Japan has in conjunction to this is the lack of individual support and a lack of individual representation in many aspects. This includes not wanting to stand out and appear gaudy or overly indulgent. Being an outlier is often seen as a negative thing, at least in my own experience and from what I've heard from other people I know that have lived in Japan. There are not many resources when seeking psychological health in Japan. It's an issue that is severely under-addressed. This causes those needing medical help to avoid doing so because of this stigma. And of course, things have gotten better, but as far as the spring of 1992, there were a lot of difficulties and a lot of things that just were not discussed. This brings us back to the documented accounts of the locals on the forum. Many recounted seeing the person who tied these ropes. The person is described as an older female with a visible mental impairment. Some say it's not immediately visible, while others say it was. Some even use phrasing to insinuate the woman was disabled, past the point of possibly being employed and self-sufficient. Now, why did this woman tie these ties? The possible reason is rather sad, as some accounts say that she did so because she needed assistance returning home and often got lost. Not having anyone to help her, despite her disability, she purchased these ties so she could mark her way home and avoid getting lost. Since these ties were later removed, I honestly hope she didn't face further difficulty following their removal. Keep in mind, this possible outcome is not confirmed. There are other possible reasonings, one recounted by Makoto Kitano himself, who you may recall is part of the on-site investigation for that specific episode. During his appearance on a podcast, he recalled the filming of that episode vividly, stating that they did find the woman herself and tried talking to her. This is when they quickly realized that she was unable to coherently cooperate with them. The woman apparently suffered from hallucinations, at least according to Kitano's account, claiming that she was unable to stop tying the ties, that she was literally terrified of stopping. Kitano does not mention anything about finding her way home in the podcast, only that the woman was unable to be interviewed due to severe paranoia and her mental state. They also feared a privacy violation since she lived nearby. This detail of the mystery was never broadcasted, obviously, due to her privacy and not wanting to showcase the unpleasant conclusion. Though, do keep in mind, none of these reasons are confirmed to be real. Some people feel that the whole thing was staged just to boost ratings or creep people out a bit and get some talk generating about the show. That doesn't really make sense to me, but because the tie suddenly vanished, a lot of people feel that may be the case. As I said previously, Night Scoop still remains on the air and airs weekly to this day. However, the nylon rope incident still remains the black sheep and that one weird episode with that not very pleasant outcome. As far as this mystery itself, it's been 31 years. Who knows if this woman is still in the area or alive and well. I sincerely hope all the attention on this situation helped her in some way. But what do you guys think? I would love to know your views and your own personal takeaways in the comments below. I understand the topics brought forward today are kind of heavy, as well as that my opinions on mental health in Japan and how people with disabilities are treated may have bled through just a little bit. Though if I incorrectly interpreted anything, I do apologize. To summarize my own thoughts and takeaways, I feel support and awareness would be wonderful to those who need it. The Nylon Ropes case is bizarre and chilling in a way, but the underlying reasons behind it are a bit sad. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. 
See you next time. It's often heard that Japan as a country has observed critically low birth rates. Birth rates that the country has worked hard to attempt in raising. But did you know Japan once saw a time in history with extremely high birth rates? What's defined as a rather sad time in Japanese history? Today I bring you an unusual topic, though that doesn't make it any less important. It's a serious issue in Japan that somehow spawned a creepypasta out of it, and a Vocaloid song. More than one character within the Yakuza games have been inspired by these incidents. Beyond that, coming-of-age novels have been written about children who survived and carried the trauma associated with these horrific incidents. The topic of coin locker babies is one that is well known throughout Japan and has had a tremendous impact on popular culture. And in this video, we're going to talk about it. Showa era Japan is a time period in history that's often romanticized as well as appreciated for its aesthetic. Between city pop, Showa idols, a simpler way of life, and just the general feel of that era in Japan, I can see why. However, what people don't typically discuss are the darker elements of it. There were clashing political views between generations, higher crime rates, and today's topic. This form of child abandonment first emerged in the decades following post-war Japan primarily in the 1970s and 80s. In Japan, in train stations and the areas nearby them, there exist these temporary lockers, referred to as coin-operated lockers. These lockers are often used to store luggage, groceries, or anything you don't want to carry around with you while you're out and about town. It's a convenient service that works well with the Japanese city lifestyle of train commutes and constant walking. You simply pay for the duration of time you want the locker for. However, some women in Showa-era Japan saw this as a grim opportunity, for it's the nature of these lockers, the short-term period in which they're used, where many assume that they would be checked frequently by other people as well as train station attendants. This gave way to a use that was not foreseen in the slightest. For these lockers started being used as a means to abandon newly born infants. These infants were just left here both babies who are alive and those who did not make it. Because these infants are left here when nobody's around to see who did it, they were often not discovered in time. The coin lockers, depending on area, are not checked as frequently as one may assume. Some of these victims are not discovered until days, weeks, or months later. And as time went on, these occurrences became more and more frequent. Observed as a serious epidemic in highly populated cities like Tokyo and Osaka. These coin locker babies continue to be discovered routinely well into the 1990s. Now, many of you out there are likely wondering how somebody could possibly do this, let alone fathom the thought. There are a number of reasons that are attributed to these incidents, though every case is different. Unfortunately, societal and economic reasons are often to blame. Single pregnant women in Japan are often faced with a lot of negativity. The topic of intercourse in itself is often hushed and not discussed, to the point that it's seen as a taboo in everyday life, or simply too private a matter to speak to somebody about. A single pregnant mother has potential to be scrutinized and shunned. This could lead to isolation. Medical procedures to terminate a pregnancy have been equally scrutinized. And if the mother is still just a teen or older and unmarried, further scrutiny is possible. The option of termination is legal in Japan, however does require the consent of the father in order to proceed in most cases. If the pregnancy is a secret, this could lead to further reluctancy. Historically, women have earned less income than men. This complicates the situation of a single mother even further. In short, a combination of traditional expectations, commonly perceived taboos, and lack of financial stability can lead to the isolation of the expecting mother. While each of these tragic situations are different, this isolation is, sadly, what could lead to these horrible coin locker incidents. 
Now, there is somewhat of a silver lining in regards to all this. The surge in coin locker baby discoveries eventually made way for laws and certain things to be put in place to prevent these issues or rectify them in some way. Safe haven laws are in place in many parts of the world. These are laws that allow mothers to anonymously leave children in safe places like hospitals and fire stations. The areas created to place the babies are heated and secure. Medical attention is alerted to come to the hatch if it's opened and activated. It was in the year 2007 when Japan created its own baby hatch system known as the White Stork's Cradle. It has saved the lives of 155 babies thus far. However, the very first actions taken were in the 1980s. Coin lockers were physically moved to more populated areas and became supervised at all times. Uma Nibu, a women's liberation movement, brought forth the issue of taboo and the scrutiny of the mothers themselves as well. It was in 1993 that rules were put in place that addressed each situation differently, depending on the age of the infant and whether or not they were alive when born. Different situations received different charges. Options in birth control became more prominent as well. AC Japan started airing various PSAs to educate both men and women on this topic. And currently, decades later, Japan is observing record lows in the birth rate itself. In 2022, it reached an all-new record low and has been dropping significantly each year for the past seven years. And the reasons associated with the shrinking Japanese populace are very similar to the reasons behind those coin locker baby incidents all those decades ago. Those still being taboo, cultural expectations, and financial limitations. In modern times, the tragic discoveries of coin locker babies have decreased significantly. It still does happen, though when they do, they're often news headlines and not something that's commonly seen. In the past 20 years, there have been only three publicized big incidents involving coin locker babies. In short, this epidemic is a thing of the past and rarely occurs nowadays. Though it now remains one of the darker attributes of a time in Japan that has long passed. The effects and remnants of this still remain in the media though, most prominently from a well-known Vocaloid song and a creepypasta that made its way onto Japanese forums. The song is titled Coin Locker Baby, and it's by an artist known as Maretu. It was created with the Hatsune Miku Vocaloid software and tells a rather unpleasant story. One easily concealed by a rather upbeat song. The speaker talks about building up the result of a non-existent secret between themselves and someone they loved but were heartbroken by. What they were building up was a pregnancy. They then placed the baby into a locker as the baby reminded them of the person who broke their heart. What follows is a toxic on and off relationship the speaker continues with the father and later other men. This causes more hardship and more pregnancies that end in tragedy. This girl becomes more and more regretful as the song goes on, carrying the trauma and remorse she eventually comes to feel as she plans to stop when she has a baby that she determines as perfect. There was once a girl who was lonely and lacked family structure. She was also recently heartbroken for the very first time by her first love who simply used her and discarded her when he got bored. The girl clinged to this man and relied on him for emotional support. She was never truly loved before and yearned for it beyond anything else in this world. The man who broke her heart was an older man whom she looked up to. She longed to grow up and become a woman to be a part of his world but these hopes were naively made. Later on, the girl found out she was pregnant, and this made her very, very scared. The only action she took upon realizing her pregnancy was to just ignore it. Being young and naive, she just hoped it would go away. Though, as her child grew and she became larger, she went to meet with the man who broke her heart and explained the whole situation. Still desperately holding on to some kind of hope in being with him and having a family, and ultimately finding happiness in that. The man, however, shoved her away and responded with nothing short of disgust. He looked at her with an empty expression and simply said he did not care. That their child was solely her problem. And when the time came finally for her to give birth, 
the baby was alive and healthy. Strangely calm, not crying or uttering any sound, yet calmly staring at her. Making eye contact with her child for the very first time, she felt overwhelmed. Weak and still in pain from what she just experienced, she panicked further, picking herself up and rushing to the nearest train station. As she placed the baby into that cold, small locker, she saw him open his eyes and look to her once again making no sound. It felt as though he was almost judging her. She panicked further, slammed the door shut, and ran away, telling herself over and over that someone would find him and that he would be okay. As the days and weeks passed by, as she passed the locker each day on her way to school, she noticed that the locker remained closed still. At this point, she expected it to be eventually opened and covered with yellow tape showing the finality of her actions, but that day never came. Eventually, those months turned into years and the girl was now a woman, engaged to a man that loved her and treated her very well. She was pregnant once again, seven months along, and happy to have the family she always yearned for. It was late one night when she walked through that very same station, on her way home after her final day of work before her maternity leave. It was within this station that she witnessed a boy in red overalls, pacing frantically back and forth and wailing. Her maternal instinct appeared to kick in and the woman was rushed to the boy without thinking. As she did, the hall began to darken and grow cold. She bent down to meet his gaze and stopped him from pacing. The boy refused to look up at her. He only looked downward at the floor. Are you all right? Where is your mother? She asked. After an almost eternal pause, the boy finally looked up to her and responded. That's when she realized it. That gaze, the gaze belonging to this boy, was the very same one she witnessed all those years ago for it was the very same gaze as the baby she abandoned. Feeling that very same state of panic, she didn't even hear him respond when he said, It's you. The very next morning, the station staff discovered a disturbing sight. A trail of fluids leading into one of the coin lockers. Within the locker and surrounding door of it, there was a series of handprints belonging to a child. Small and varying in size, it could have been multiple children. No bodies were ever found. And that's the tale of the Coin Locker Baby Creepypasta. While the identity of the author is unknown, the story almost feels like a warning. Perhaps warning others to not make the same decisions the mothers of the Coin Locker Babies have in the past. In conclusion, this is a very heavy topic with a lot of other heavy topics associated with it. Despite that, I feel like it's a very important topic and element of Japanese history that should be discussed. One thing I've always wanted to do with this channel is look at both the good and bad of Japan from an unbiased perspective. Japan has a lot of good, but there are some darker elements that aren't really discussed. With all of that said, I sincerely hope you guys found this video informative and enlightening for that reason. Anyways, that's all for today, and I will see you in the next video. On a brisk early morning in 2007, a Tuchan user was outside in Shinjuku. Passing through an alleyway behind a hospital, not another person in sight, they began to hear something unusual. Singing, described as beautiful but weak and haunting. The poster ultimately concluded that the singing was coming from a courtyard of some sort at the back of Keio University Hospital within Shinjuku. With how early in the morning it still was and how dark it was because of that and the eerie sound of the voice, the poster said they ultimately fled. At around 5 a.m., they made a post on Tuchan sharing what they had heard. The response and events that would follow catalog this post in infamy. Let's discuss why that is. Kanagawa, Japan, 1967. A baby girl was born, named Sachiko Kamachi. Her father was a driving instructor and the girl experienced a relatively peaceful childhood. As Sachiko grew, she thrived in all of her pursuits. Fellow elementary school students recalled her as beautiful, popular, and athletic. 
On top of this, she also had a great deal of musical talent, playing piano since she was only four years of age. After pursuing track and field in middle school as well as tennis in high school, Sachiko graduated and moved to the small Kanagawa city known as Atsuki. It was here where she attended Shoin Women's College and graduated. After graduation, Sachiko was hired at a real estate office within Atsuki, leading an adult life as peaceful as her childhood, distinctly removed from the fast-paced lifestyle of the entertainment industry. That is, until one fateful day sometime in 1988. This was when one of her clients happened to be a representative with Stardust Promotion, one of Japan's biggest talent agencies. Sachiko spent the remainder of the 1980s taking up a wide range of modeling gigs, among the most interesting being her time as a karaoke queen. basically acting in footage that played on screen over a karaoke track. She was also what's known as a racing queen, and was also featured in various videos showcasing her as a model. In 1989, she was given a minor acting role for the drama Shunto. <laughs> During her time modeling, Sachiko met a man named Daiko Nagato, a prominent music producer. Nagato saw a great deal of musical talent in Sachiko and felt her true potential wasn't lived up to in the modeling world. This was when Sachiko received yet another important offer. And she accepted this offer, and with accepting this offer, she ultimately changed her name to one that's better known throughout Japan today, that name being Izumi Sakai. With this decision, the now Sakai also decided to conceal her true age. Her true 1967 date of birth wasn't to be shown on any profiles moving forward. It was instead listed as 1969. Because so many entertainers and idols in Japan start very, very young, Sakai likely felt that her being even slightly older would make her less valuable in the industry. While sad, the entertainment industry in general just favors those who are younger. That very next year, in 1991, Izumi Sakai would join the five-member musical group Sard as their lead vocalist. And from here, Izumi Sakai's fame skyrocketed. However, despite her newfound attention and massive fame throughout Japan at this time, she remained humble and very private. Izumi Sakai was also noted to be quite shy. <laughs> Following the breakout success of Zard's first album, Goodbye My Loneliness, Sakai very rarely made TV appearances. During the handful of appearances she has made, most notably on the show Music Station, she's seen not wearing makeup and wearing somewhat casual clothes. <laughs> Not really a big deal, but many people took note of it at the time. When not recording music, Sakai was often spending time with her family, notably assisting her parents in funding a full home remodel for them. In general, Sakai was just seen as a kind and humble person, often treating those she worked with with the utmost respect. It was Sakai's reserved way of life and very rare television appearances that ultimately fueled an urban legend. As I said previously, Zard technically consists of five members. Those members being Izumi Sakai, Fumihito Machida, Kosuke Michikura, Hiroyasu Hoshi, and Kimitaka Ikezawa. Despite this, Izumi Sakai was primarily the one who showed up on the album art and who had the most screen time in music videos. This led fans to think that she wasn't the actual vocalist, because of her beauty and lack of public appearances like some kind of Milli Vanilli situation. However, looking at her sparse TV appearances and live performances, they say otherwise. As the new millennium began, Zard remained very popular and prominent throughout Japan as a musical group. However, it was also around this time when Izumi Sakai's health began to deteriorate. It was in 2001 when Sakai began seeing a doctor for various issues related to her uterus. These are believed to be fibroids and endometriosis, two very painful and debilitating conditions. Sakai was able to continue her career pursuits, even beginning to branch out with solo work, though it was in the mid-2000s when her health began deteriorating further. 
This was when Izumi Sakai was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Around this same time, it was learned that the illness had spread to her lungs. It was also around this time when Sakai began an extended stay at Keio University Hospital to receive treatment. Despite the grim news, Sakai was observed by family, friends, and staff as incredibly optimistic in her ability to get better, continuing to make plans for her solo album. Sakai was often seen taking daily walks around the hospital and going outside to meditate. Another thing many people witnessed her doing was singing. One song in particular that many recall her singing at this time was Makenaide, a song made for Zard. The translation of the phrase Makenaide is don't lose or don't give up. This brings us back to that early morning Tuchan post, one that seemingly preceded tragic and significant events. And now with the news in brief, the female lead singer of the pop group Zard, Izumi Sakai, has died after falling off a hospital stairway. She was 40 years old. May 26th of 2007. Sakai was discovered behind Keio University Hospital by a passerby at 5.40 a.m. Sakai was brought to the hospital's emergency room and was unconscious. She never regained consciousness again. Izumi Sakai would pass away surrounded by family one day later. The place she was found at that morning was her favorite spot to meditate. It had rained heavily the night before, and Sakai likely slipped and fell when walking outside. The passing of Izumi Sakai was officially announced on the 27th. However, seemingly at 5 a.m. on the 26th, the following post was made to Tuchan. Hey, someone is singing a Zard song. It's in the plaza behind the hospital at this time. Which hospital? Are you in Shin Okubo as well? Yes. Keio University Hospital. The voice is beautiful, actually. It's weak, though. It somehow feels hollow. Almost as if it could disappear at any moment. It's... scary. With the news of Sakai's passing, a screenshot of these posts were spread like wildfire. People were enamored with the knowledge of what Sakai was doing in her final moments of consciousness. If her final words were the lyrics of her own song, her own music, and the last thing she ever did was sing, then this was seen as almost poetic amidst the tragic news of her ultimate passing. It made sense, too. People often saw Sakai singing to herself within the hospital, particularly the more uplifting songs. This truly showed that Izumi Sakai truly loved being a singer at its core, not about the fame of it all. But, as with most things given life on the internet, the more attention they get, the more people will find faults within them and make sure to share these faults with others. And the faults within this post, well, they certainly began to pile up. The way the poster spoke was a bit dramatized for one, as if they were making the occurrence more creepy than it actually would be in real life. And that's not all. You see, the screenshot was everywhere online, but nobody could track down the original post on Tuchan itself. To elaborate a bit, Tuchan adds these cheeky little titles to the poster's number to show what board the post was made on. While users are anonymous, they get a number and this title. The title is visible in this screenshot. It basically says, Anonymous Person Taking a Walk. So, to clarify further, every post on this board would be Anonymous Person Taking a Walk, but the number is different. This poster was Anonymous Person Taking a Walk, number 602. These titles are never this specific, and no forum exists that gives the user this specific title. Following this discovery, it wasn't long before the truth behind the post was made clear. Yep. As anticlimactic as this whole Tuchan ordeal is, this whole thing was falsified. Made to become a famous Japanese kolpipe or copy pasta. Nobody ever saw Izumi Sakai singing behind the hospital. It was just a tasteless ploy to spread a fake rumor. And it's now among Japan's most infamous copy pastas. As far as who made the image itself, we don't really know. Tracking down the very first use of this image is possible, though. And despite many knowing it's fake now, many people who saw the news saw this copy pasta and just believed it was real and moved on, believe it's real to this very day. There are still many people out there that believe Izumi Sakai's final words were the lyrics of her own song.
Regardless of these urban legends and online gossip, Izumi Sakai is remembered very fondly. Many feel that Sakai herself was Zard and that her herself was the embodiment that made the group what it was. Many feel that Zard died along with Sakai. If you're not familiar with their musical works, I highly recommend checking them out on Spotify. I'll go ahead and link that in the description. This is a well-known AC Japan PSA from 2003. It's categorized on the Do Not Search wiki as one of the most famous of the PSAs that AC Japan has put out. The PSA is simple enough. It's similar to Kitchen Mother in that it showcases parents engaging in the act of dieting and leaving their children alone. On the real though, this ad has a very striking amount of ascendancy in commanding the audience's attention for only 30 seconds. This one aired to make known the dangers of a rise in sea level due to global warming. While the ad itself is certainly stirring, there's a creepy urban legend tied to this ad that gained a lot more notoriety. You may not have caught it, but around 8 seconds into the commercial, on the right side of the screen, you can see a black figure emerge from the water ever so slightly before becoming submerged. It's gone as quickly as it was seen. Many people perceive this figure as a hand reaching up in desperation as they attempt to stay afloat. Once you're aware of it, it's definitely creepy. Those who want a more logical explanation to this occurrence believe the figure may just have been a surfer that simply wasn't edited out of the shot. If you have some familiarity with creepy internet stories, then you may have already heard of this poem by Yomota Inuhiko. It was written in 1919 and has some very poignant and unpleasant subject matter as it narrates a boy and his siblings as they make the descent into hell. Good times all around over here. There's an urban legend surrounding this poem as well. According to the legend, the reader will be cursed to perish or have tragic things happen to them if they read this poem out loud. Don't, don't worry guys, I'm not going to read any of this poem out loud to you. Rather not become cursed for the sake of my content if it hasn't happened already. Anyways, according to the legend, this poem is A-OK -okay to read silently to yourself within your mind. So, you know, go ahead and do that if you wanna. There's also this painting strongly associated with the poem, though it has nothing to do with the actual poem. The art is done by the still-living artist Yuko Tatsushima, and definitely worth checking out if you like this kind of, you know, aesthetic. <laughs> Yet another bizarre thread that just kind of spiraled out of control. Unlike the Denkel saga, where the issue is clearly defined almost to an infuriating degree, this one is kind of hard to pinpoint. And this time around in this thread, it's actually the confusion that leads to the frustration. I'll try and give you guys the abridged version. There's really a lot to unpack here, much like the Denkel saga thread. A man, OP, had just proposed to his girlfriend and she said yes. The couple was a little tight on money at the time, so they had just decided to delay the actual wedding and go straight to registering the marriage legally. For the entire time the couple was together, OP had assumed his fiancé's legal name was this one specific name. He even recalled seeing this name on a class roster when the couple attended class together in college. While OP admitted that he often used a nickname when referring to his fiance and even had the nickname saved in his phone, he was almost positive that her real name was something completely different to what it actually was when she signed the marriage papers. The name OP had assumed, one that he dubbed Hanako Sato within the thread, was instead a name that was in no way similar or easily confused with Hanako Sato, one he described as sounding somewhat obnoxious. He dubbed her actual name, Elizabeth Ijuin, in the thread. Keep in mind, these names are not the real names, they were just for privacy's sake and to make the situation a little more distinguishable. But despite this, OP swore that he saw the name Hanako Sato on that school roster all those years ago. He even recalled his fiancée recognizing that name on said roster as her own name. So, what on earth was going on? A very confused OP decided to bite the bullet and just ask his fiancée himself. 
This exchange had the fiancé very confused, basically saying, what are you even talking about? And just kind of dismissing it. And it's time for this already really confusing thread to get even more confusing, like, who was Hanako Sato? As the thread title suggests, OP felt like his fiancée Hanako was suddenly replaced with this Elizabeth person. It was at this point that OP began having a bit of a crisis. He claimed that, looking at old photos, he didn't even recognize the face of his fiancée, that she suddenly looked like a different person. Like, literally. That Hanako was in the old photos and Elizabeth was suddenly here in real life replacing Hanako. OP claimed that the girl in the old photos was Hanako and that the girl in the recent phone photos he had was Elizabeth, but both girls had the same nickname he frequently used to refer them as. OP dubbed this nickname Chiwa. OP felt as though he merged with an alternate dimension where he was with an Elizabeth now, not Hanako anymore. The other posters in the thread ask various questions, like if he had any memory disorders or if the nickname sounded like Elizabeth in any way. Some even asked if his fiancée was Korean or Chinese because there are cultures where some people genuinely have two separate names. Some just joke that the fiancée must have stopped wearing makeup at some point, but OP insisted the change in features was far more drastic than that. The conversation slowly shifted to people asking OP more directly about any history of mental illness. It seemed that a lot of people felt they should hone in on that specific aspect as OP continued to panic. The whole situation just didn't make any sense. Some people did hone in on their time in college. OP had mentioned that the fiancé was in a Rakugo club, Rakugo being a type of traditional Japanese stand-up storytelling. Some also recommended contacting friends who knew both the fiancé and OP in college. And so, upon asking a college friend, OP claimed he never heard the name Elizabeth E. Juin in his life, that being the friend never heard it, and that the fiancé's name wasn't Elizabeth to his recollection. OP continued to add that he showed an old photo of his fiancé to be sure to his friend, and his friend still said that was Hanako, that was not an Elizabeth. So, that convoluted the situation a bit more. The confusing situation continued, with OP even considering to go to the hospital to be evaluated because people just kept suggesting that. This is something he did consider, but flip-flopped with actually doing, and he felt that he wasn't mentally unstable or that that was the issue. OP eventually updated the thread by saying he recently met up with yet another college friend and got some drinks. He brought the old photos and his friend confirmed that these were in fact photos of his fiancée. That the old Hanako photos were definitely photos of the now Elizabeth. The friend was baffled that this was even a question that OP even asked, and also recommended that OP see a doctor. But then... OP came home a little drunk that same night and told his fiancée about the friend. According to OP, the fiancée apparently didn't remember this friend at all. OP also asked his fiancée about the Chiwa nickname and how that came about and its origin, and her explanation was the same as OP remembered. The facts regarding the nickname did still add up. However, despite all of this, OP confirmed that he was still very much in love with his fiancée and still intended to marry her despite all this chaos going on. And now we come to the conclusion. OP was later confronted by two friends who asked to see more photos, both old and new. These friends did confirm that the girls in the photos old and new were the same girl, that Hanako was Elizabeth. OP didn't believe them and didn't see the resemblance, but then the friends pointed out that the fiancé was wearing the same necklace in the photos, that the only thing that was different was her hairstyle as she had changed it. The friends then asked OP if he had ever heard of a condition called prosopagnosia. For those out there wondering, this is a condition where those afflicted cannot recognize a person by their face. Following this post, OP claimed that his fiancé was confronted by OP and his friends that same day, and was now saying her name was Hanako Sato. There's a bit more of a back and forth, and OP claims Hanako Elizabeth doesn't recognize herself in the old photos either, but it's here at the end of this whole thread where the story is far more disjointed and confusing. OP's posts definitely seem more disjointed and frantic. 
Ultimately, OP thanks everyone for listening, doesn't really confirm what his plan of action is now, and he just kind of dips. This is the last time the OP is officially heard from on Tuchan. He's never heard from again. Now, many people have many theories about this thread, and once again, I'm really, really abridging the whole ordeal. It's very, very confusing if you read through the whole thing organically. It could have all been fiction, of course, but if not, then OP may have had some kind of mental disorder or emergency health situation that caused all this. These types of PSAs, often short bumpers aired late at night, exist in many countries to spread awareness of wanted, dangerous criminals and people who are missing. It's not surprising that this type of broadcast would exist in Japan as well, because, you know, crime exists everywhere. There are actually a lot of mysteries and creepy urban legends that involve wanted or missing persons broadcasts, specifically the ones with the off-putting black and white, uncanny photos. It's also not surprising that a great deal of these broadcasts are lost media and that there are search efforts to try and recover them. These broadcasts were shown heavily every February from 1970 to around the mid-1980s. These were said to be shown late at night or in the evening. There is one source that claims Tokyo Broadcasting Station, or TBS, aired these around 5 or 6 p.m. between 1970 and 1985-ish. This is one testimony and there's... There's quite a few testimonies. Testimony makes it sound a little criminal. Um, accounts, that's a better word. Uh, accounts. Uh, we're going with accounts. There are documented accounts on the Japanese Lost Commercial Wiki that I've been using as reference for some of these things in this series that recall that the broadcast began with some kind of siren or chime noise. Something tertiary that would alert the viewer to, you know, look at the screen. A narrator then supposedly says, This is an announcement from the Metropolitan Police Department, or, you know, something that translates to that, and then there's a blue background that appears, and then a black and white photo, a headshot of the criminal in question, that is displayed in the foreground. <laughs> The narration is then said to provide a description of the person, the criminal, and what they are wanted for. The narrator then says to call a phone number, and many accounts believe that this phone number was 110, and that the narrator said to dial it and call if they knew anything about this person. The criminal. There is a creepy recreation of one of these public broadcast announcements with the criminals that does exist online, and there are newspaper versions of these PSAs that have been found. These newspapers also confirm that the start date of these broadcasts was in February of 1970. Many accounts of those who remember these PSAs say they were very off-putting and even scary. I read a few comments of people who remember these and say they were pretty much nightmare fuel when they were children and saw them come on. Now, there isn't much info on which ones have been found or how many even exist to begin with. I do have a good feeling that a lot of these likely exist on VHS tapes from recorded programmings and, you know, they just got caught in the commercial breaks during the programming. At the very least, I feel this would be the case for ones that aired in the early to mid-80s as VHS recording was a thing then. With the 70s, it wasn't as commonplace, though it did exist. When it comes to Japanese PSAs, Hitogata has caught the attention of many outside of Japan due to its mystery and search efforts. This one is possible lost media, though not confirmed to actually exist. Being another case with its foundation laid by Tuchan accounts and nothing concrete like a print ad or catalog entry, this PSA is seen as simply an urban legend to many in Japan these days. Something taken seriously in its early days on the internet, though not so much anymore. For those unfamiliar, Hitogata is a rumored lost PSA that is said to have aired late at night anywhere between the 1980s and early 2000s. It's said to display two white silhouettes that fade in and out in a synchronized fashion as the sound of railway crossing sirens can be heard. It is said that something along the lines of every two seconds someone dies appears on screen, though the accounts and phrasing does vary. 
AC Japan has been contacted in regard to this ad and claim they have no association with anything remotely like this. Hitogata is speculated to be a PSA for railway safety due to similar accounts of the railway visuals and sounds, though nothing has been confirmed despite the search going on for quite some time. It is possible that something like this does exist, maybe it was only ran briefly and in a specific area, but for now its existence is unconfirmed. If you would like more information, I highly recommend the Lost Media Wiki article as well as their official Discord as search efforts were active on there and now documented. Hey guys! I'm spooky today! Minus the slow voice though! So, the future. It's something that can bring a lot of excitement and uncertainty to many, many people. And if you're a member of the anime and manga community, you may be familiar with some predictions some mangaka supposedly made that actually happened. Examples I can think of that involve this are Akira and the Tokyo Olympics thingy that, you know, kinda happened recently. And also Hirohiko Araki, the creator of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, having a panel that kind of alludes to the future events of 9-11. It does not end there, however. There is a mangaka who has actually predicted 15 events, and 12 of them actually came true. With that said, in this video, I'm going to introduce you guys to Ryo Tatsuki and her terrifying prophecies. So, who is Ryo Tatsuki? She's certainly not a well-known name, and her works aren't your typical popular Naruto Dragon Ball demon slayers you see today. As a matter of fact, her works haven't garnered any attention until recently, being spring of 2021 and 10 years prior in 2011, as they kind of gather a following and popularity in Japan when something bad happens. Due to this, Tatsuki has kind of a cult following now. This boom in popularity has caused the first editions of one specific work, one from 1999 titled Watashi ga Mita Mirai, to go up exponentially in price. Well, until it was no longer out of print, that is. Though I have read that these newer prints supposedly have certain disturbing and unsettling scenes cut from each volume. And what is this manga about? What is this Watashi ga Mita Mirai about? A title that translates in English to The Future As I See It. Jeez, I wonder. Let's backpedal a little bit though. Ryo Tatsuki was born in Yokohama in 1954 and began writing manga in 1975. It was in this year that they published manga, shoujo manga specifically, in the magazine Monthly Princess. The articles I read say manga titled Monthly Princess, but all I can find is the magazine that publishes the manga, so... I'm pretty sure it's the Also, real quick, it's worth noting that her previous works are shoujo manga and considered to be standard shoujo fare, though I cannot find what these specific works are on the internet searching in English and Japanese. If I do, they're gonna be on the screen, but I cannot find them. I'm assuming she posted them, published them, under a different name. So, five years come and go, and it's the year 1980. Ryo is still publishing shoujo manga, but it's also around this time where she began having strange dreams. These dreams were startling dreams of clairvoyance that supposedly foretold future events. After five years, on and off, of experiencing such dreams, Tatsuki decided to start writing her dreams in a journal. This was around the year 1985. And it was finally in 1994 to 1999 that she began publishing her prophecies in manga form. This manga was, of course, Watashi ga Mita Mirai. And this brings us to the manga itself as well as the prophecies within it. I gotta be honest, the plot of this manga itself is a mystery to me. 
I mean, there are articles detailing the manga and screenshots of the cover of the Tonkobans themselves, as well as a little bit inside the manga. It is my assumption that this manga is basically her foretellings as she illustrates her dreams. And they're separate stories and they're not really connected. There's no protagonist, there's no separate characters, no separate story. I think they're just straight up her predictions. And while on that note, I cannot find any kind of listing on my anime list either. So it is pretty obscure. So, what are these prophecies? You may recall me saying 2011 and 2021 a little bit earlier, and that may give you kind of a hint about the catastrophes in question. If you guessed a certain thing we're still kind of dealing with, you, you are right. Let's start at the beginning, though. According to Tatsuki herself, the first big prophecy she dreamed of was the death of Freddie Mercury. For those unfamiliar, he was the lead singer of the band Queen and passed away in 1991. Tatsuki claimed she had two separate dreams foretelling his death, the first one being in 1976 and the second one being in 1981. These dreams were seen by Tatsuki exactly 15 and 10 years before the singer's passing. Tatsuki also claimed that the foretelling of the Bohemian Rhapsody movie was also in her dreams. Keep in mind these dates, as some of them take place, as far as the dreams or the occurrences themselves, before the publication of the manga and the dream diary that Tatsuki has mentioned. The next premonition took place in January of 1995. This is when Tatsuki had a dream about the earth cracking in the Kobe region of Japan. It was only 15 days after this dream that a huge earthquake struck the Kobe region of Japan. This was the Great Hanshin Earthquake. Now, there is a claim that about 20 people had learned about Tatsuki's premonition prior to the earthquake itself and actually did evacuate. I cannot find confirmation on this though. The next premonition was in a dream that Tatsuki had recorded in 1992. According to Tatsuki, the dream was rather blurry and she had difficulty making a lot of it out. She did, however, write two words in her dream diary as she woke up. Diana and Shinda. This translates to the name Diana and dead. It was five years after this premonition, in the year 1997, that Princess Diana tragically died. Tatsuki had also claimed that in 1995, she had a dream of attending a funeral, which was her own funeral. It was in the year 2000 that she actually decided to retire as a mangaka. Tatsuki has clarified that she believes this premonition was the premonition of her own ending of her career. The next one is one of the big ones. In March of 1996, Tatsuki awoke from a dream that she describes as a catastrophe somewhere in eastern Japan in March of 2011. This one is special because she actually published this in her manga right afterwards to warn people. Because of that, it was on record and published before the event itself. This catastrophe was believed to be the 2011 Great East Japan Earthquake and Tsunami. Now, this next one is the one that Ryo Tatsuki is currently very well known for. This one is from a dream she had in 1995. After awaking from this dream, Tatsuki wrote that in 25 years, an unknown virus will come in 2020. It will disappear after peaking in April and appear again 10 years later. Now, of course, a virus did appear, though the dates are a little off. Now, whether or not it'll appear in 10 more years, I, I sure hope not, but we have yet to see. And with that said, there are other predictions that we have also yet to see and hopefully won't see. The first one is the supposed eruption of Mount Fuji. That's right, buds. In case you didn't know, Mount Fuji is a dormant volcano. Now, Tatsuki has claimed this may happen on August 20th of 2021. Spoiler alert, it did not. Or every 15 years until 2141. So it's all kind of up in the air. 
Another one of Tatsuki's predictions is a Kanagawa earthquake and tsunami. This was also predicted in the year 1991, and Tatsuki claims it'll happen between June and September of 2026, or every 15 years until 2131, so again, a little broad. So, this begs the question, are these predictions legit? Honestly, who knows? I mean, yes, the two big predictions of the earthquake and, you know, the pandemic, they're pretty, pretty wild, pretty interesting, and that definitely is reason enough for people to flock to her manga, a manga that no one really knew about until those events. So, my unbiased take on this whole thing is, I mean, it is possible. The only person who really knows that this is possible and a thing that is experienced and exists is Ryo Tatsuki herself.